Morning, everybody. Good morning. 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 Are we ready or do you want me to hold my breath for a while? <laughs> Looks like Nathan and a few others are still like, uh, everyone's still getting logged on. Okay, that's fine. We'll wait. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Nathan. Uh, good morning, Governor. Thanks for being on this morning. I think we're we're just waiting for a a few more of the task force members to join. So we'll it'll just be a few more minutes before we get started. Okay, sounds good, Nathan. Thanks. Hey, good morning, everyone. We'll just give it a couple more minutes. I see some people are still joining. I just want to give everyone a couple more minutes to, uh, to log in here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I see a few more people. We're waiting for a few more task force members to join, and we'll get started here at about 10.05. So let's just give it a couple more minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just waiting on a couple more folks to join us. So we'll get started here in just a couple minutes, everyone. Sounds good. Last one on buys breakfast, right? <laughs> yes. That's the rule. <laughs> how do you how do you do a virtual breakfast? Fewer calories. Yeah, that's right.
Okay, everyone. I think we have one or two folks who are we're still waiting on, but uh, hopefully they'll be able to join us here in just a few minutes. So I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so good morning. Uh, welcome to the sixth meeting of the Governor's Task Force on Reducing Prescription Drug Prices. Um, today, we're very honored to have uh, Governor Evers joining us uh, to say a few words about why he created this task force. Uh, I know the governor had been scheduled to join us up in Wausau back in March, and uh, obviously that meeting got canceled. So uh, we appreciate uh, him and his staff working with us to, to reschedule uh, so he's able to join us today. Um, Governor, if it's okay, before I turn it over to you, uh, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, so just wanna, okay. So um, I guess, first of all, I'll say, obviously you can see that I'm wearing a mask. Uh, today I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. First of all, I am doing this meeting in my office and we do have a, a requirement that anyone who's in the office has to wear masks. Um, but secondly, and more importantly, um, you know, as we continue to see the COVID-19 cases spiking across the state and across the country, uh, we really think it's important that we are modeling um, the, the, the proper mask wearing behavior. And so that's why today I will be uh, wearing a mask. I see the governor is also wearing a mask. So we think it's important that uh, we model that behavior. Um, so today uh, during our meeting, we will continue uh, going through the prescription drug supply chain, uh, focusing on manufacturers, uh, we'll be hearing from Pfizer, as well as the uh, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma. Uh, we will also hear from Civica Rx this afternoon. And uh, unfortunately, we did have uh, a last minute change of plans and we won't be hearing from uh, Good Rx today. Um, well, we're disappointed that they won't be able to join us. Uh, this does give us a little more time uh, for a robust discussion throughout the day, throughout the presentations. So uh, I encourage everyone as we have in the past to ask questions and uh, use the time to really have a good discussion. Um, just wanna remind everyone that this is a public meeting. We do have members of the public joining us. Although uh, as in the past, uh, only the task force members will have their microphones unmuted. Um, and if you do as a task force member, if you uh, would like to speak or ask a question, please use the chat box to, uh, to, to let me know that you'd like to speak and I will acknowledge you just to help keep things uh, running in an orderly fashion. Um, and then of course, I guess the last thing is, uh, please make sure to keep yourselves muted just to avoid any background noise if you're, if you're not talking. So I will, I'll pause there and see if there are any questions before we move forward. Okay. Doesn't look like it. Well, with that then, Governor, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Nathan, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Uh, really important work. I first want to thank each of the members of the task force for your hard work and dedication. Obviously, meeting like this is uh, it, it, it creates challenges, but uh, uh, it, the work is really important. The cost of prescription drugs is a serious concern facing countless people across the state of Wisconsin. So over the last couple months, you've done a, the hard work of evaluating the supply chain and considering the roles of insurers, pharmacists, hospitals, and other entities that help make sure patients get the medication they need. And obviously this isn't an easy task. We know that the solutions are complicated and it will take your collaboration and continued support to improve the entire system for the benefit of um, all Wisconsinites. That's why I'm proud that this task force has opened nearly every meeting by listening directly to patients. You stay focused on what really matters, the folks who need life-saving and sustain, uh, sustaining uh, prescription drugs. Um, before I joined you today, I was reviewing the work you've done and noticed a theme uh, from the consumer stories that uh, the medications folks are struggling with to afford are everyday ones like insulin. Now, no one should go broke trying to manage diabetes. Uh, we've, got, we've got to do better. That's why I created this task force and you are here to help us find meaningful solutions to help people to afford the uh, medications that they need. Um, now, I'm asking you not only for general policy ideas, but for specific ideas 
that can become part of our next state budget. Uh, you've already made incredible progress towards that goal. But uh, when you deliver your report this fall, I'm counting on you to continue to make change possible by sustaining this broad coalition that is reflective of all of you. We need to keep you, uh, uh, keep you working with policymakers and other elected officials to make that happen. That also means that I'm counting on you to continue to grow this coalition beyond the task force. And I know in the pandemic times that's gonna be difficult, but we need individuals and businesses, uh, the public sector, insurers, doctors, pharmacists, and hospitals to work together. So uh, I believe in your ability to make change happen. And uh, not only am I counting on you, but uh, this is, this is a obviously a statewide problem and, and a national problem. And if we can be national leaders, uh, uh, we should be. Um, so, and I obviously want to thank Nathan Hodek and uh, Jennifer Stegall and the others at OCI for continuing to lead this task force especially during this uh, time of a pandemic. So thanks for having me folks and uh, stay, stay safe. And uh, of course, as Nathan talked about before, mask up, it's, uh, it's really important for our state, especially at this time when uh, we seemingly are surging in the wrong direction. I know we can overcome this. Uh, it's just a matter of us uh, uh, individually and uh, your families and others that you, uh, hang out with, um, making sure that everybody is safe and doing the right thing. So I appreciate all your good work. I know this is really complex and uh, complex work, but it's very important and, uh, and whatever we can do to come up with practical solvable uh, solutions that are solutions that will solve things, um, we will be in a much better place. So thanks a lot, Nathan, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, everybody. Oh, thank you, Governor. Appreciate that. Sorry, I was talking. I was on mute. Uh, but thanks for being here today. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate those comments and for, you know, reinforcing the the importance of uh, the work that this task force in, is doing and, um, you know, the the importance, uh, the the impact that it has on just so many people across the state who are struggling to afford their medication. So absolutely. You. And it's, it's, it's such a great group that you have. And so keep up the good work. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, and I also, I want to reinforce, you know, the governor's points about um, continuing to stay involved. You know, I really see uh, the work we're doing as uh, the, the beginning, um, the beginning step of a multi-step process here. You know, we've been having really good discussions, hearing really good presentations over the last few months. Uh, a lot of these discussions, the information we've been receiving will uh, inform the report that will be uh, issued to the governor in the fall. Um, but the work doesn't end there. You know, we obviously need to continue to be uh, involved, continue to uh, work with our advocacy coalitions, um, make your voices heard, because it's really gonna be critically important as we look ahead to next year, uh, going into the ne next state budget process, the next legislative process starting in January, um, that that you continue to stay involved and really continue to, to push forward uh, the, the meaningful policy proposals that, um, that you know, we all know need to be implemented, but, but they're not easy. So it's gonna take a lot of work. And uh, to the governor's point, really appreciate everyone not just being involved with this task force, but uh, continuing on um, uh, beyond the work of this task force. So you know, with that, uh, as we've done in the past, we'd like to share consumer experience. Uh, today, we're going to, instead of having a video, um, we have a doctor from Milwaukee who's going to be calling in to share some of her experiences. Uh, Dr. Horner Eibler is the medical director of the Bread of Healing Clinic in Milwaukee. Um, doctor, are you on the line? I am. Fantastic. I will turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, I'm a physician at the Bread of Healing Clinic in Milwaukee. Our clinic is a uh, free clinic that serves uninsured adults with chronic illness. So 65% of our patients have hypertension, 25 to 30% have diabetes, 25% have uh, asthma or COPD, 
about 20% have high hyperlipidemia. All of them are over income for Badger Care, generally earning between about 13 and $20,000 annually. We've found that they can afford to purchase the ACA policies. The premiums are affordable. However, when they try to use their policies uh, for their health care, when they have chronic illness, the expenses become unaffordable, even with the cost sharing that's built into the program. I'll give you one example, but I could give you 1,500 more. A longtime patient of ours who had worked all of her life in the service industry earned about $15,000 a year. She recently received a raise at work and was excited to be able to purchase her own health insurance. She didn't want to have to rely on the free clinic. She scheduled an appointment to see me in the, my private practice with her new insurance. The day of her appointment, she proudly presented her insurance card at the desk. I saw her and wrote two prescriptions for two inhalers, albuterol and Advair to treat her asthma, which is her only medical condition. We planned for all of her screenings, the colonoscopy, a mammogram, a pap smear. She left my office and stopped at a local pharmacy to purchase two prescriptions. She called me in a panic when the pharmacist told her it would be $585 for one month. And in subsequent months, she would also be expected to pay $585 for the two inhalers until she met her $1,500 deductible. It used to be that medication costs were not subject to the deductible and instead there was a simple and fairly affordable copay with each filling of each prescription. That, the, that was the amount advertised by the insurance company whose plan she bought. Her copay would be $43 a month for her each inhaler. But she felt like she could save that $86 a month and be able to purchase them. She didn't realize that they would charge the full cost of her medications until she reached her deductible. So unfortunately, she was in a position of having to let her insurance lapse so that she would again be eligible for the patient assistance programs at the pharmaceutical companies to get her inhalers. This is a decision that every patient in our clinic has to face at some point. Purchase an insurance, covener, insurance policy that will not cover the costs of healthcare or forego the insurance to be eligible for the medications that are provided by the pharmaceutical companies, but then be at risk should you ever need a hospitalization. It's an untenable position, and it's one that's really not fair to ask of anyone, but our patients are in that position. So I will conclude there and, and be open to any questions. Thank you, Doctor. Really appreciate you being here and for sharing that story. And uh, unfortunately, I think there's just too many stories like that out there and we continue to hear those over and over again. Um, and so particularly I, around inhalers and insulin as somebody had already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any questions for the doctor? Okay, well, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that story. That's you really bet. important. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Good. Okay, well, uh, with that, we will uh, begin the presentations for today. As I mentioned, uh, today is primarily focused on hearing from the manufacturer perspective, uh, continuing on as we have through each of the meetings, hearing from the different entities within the segments of the, the supply chain. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Popovian from uh, Pfizer. Good morning. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Horner Ibler. I have to say that the uh, comments that you made about the patient does really resonate. So I'm Robert Popovian. I am a uh, Vice President for U.S. Government Relations at Pfizer. My background is I'm a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist, uh, residency trained in infectious diseases, and I also have a master's in pharmaceutical economics and policy. I've been in the space of healthcare economics for the last 25 to 30 years. Most of my experience is in payment reform, actually, uh, because I believe personally that fee-for-service model that we currently have in the marketplace is untenable and needs to be changed. 
Um, I'm also a board member for the Board of Counselors of the University of Southern California School of Pharmacy, as well as I'm on the Board of Advisors for Capital Rx, which is a pharmacy benefit manager. So I have experience both from an academic standpoint as well as business pharmacy benefit manager standpoint. I think uh, I want to thank the uh, for this opportunity to address the uh, task force, but I want to start with something that the governor said, and it resonated with me because he said we need to come up with some, this is a serious issue that we need to discuss, and in my opinion, it needs to be discussed with, uh, requires a data-driven serious discussion to come up with policies that are really ultimately going to help the patients. So, uh, with all that said, let's go to the first slide. And I'm not sure if I'm going to. Okay, perfect. So people ask me all the time, why is it so complicated to talk about drug pricing and spending in the U.S.? And the reason being is that, and this is one of my favorite slides, is because it, a lot of people have their hands in the cookie jar with regards to drug spending and uh, pricing. And a lot of entities that you see on the slide make money every time a dollar is spent on drugs. Um, now, the lion's share, and I'll share with you the percentages, goes to the pharmaceutical industry. But there are other entities in the marketplace, such as providers, pharmacy benefit managers, insurers, public payers, including state Medicaid programs, brokers, academicians, hospitals, and wholesalers, and pharmacies, and physicians who make money every time a drug is basically we pay for a drug in the U.S., and that's why it's so complicated, because as soon as you start discussing this, it becomes uh, a very uh, difficult issue to address. So we've gotten to a point, if you go to the next slide, that in 2018, for every dollar that was sold by pharmaceutical industry, and this is on the macro level, pharmaceutical companies gained 54 cents. The other 46 cents went to somewhere else within the supply chain. Uh, and this is important to note because this is why there's so many entities involved in it and why it is so complicated to discuss this issue. Because we're not gaining 100% of the profit, somewhere else is, it's going. As soon as you try to fix the model, someone is gonna lose money, not just the pharmaceutical industry. For example, and you're gonna hear more about this uh, later on, but a program like 340B, as soon as you try to m fix the 340B program because there's some abuse going on, the hospitals will start like uh, claiming that that's not tenable for them. So everybody has their hand and everybody needs to understand that it's much more complicated than what we have. The next slide, please. So this is the problem that has occurred over time. And this is what's called the, the, driven by the gross to net pricing bubble. And the best depiction is that for uh, when we raise our prices as an industry, what you see is the retail price or the list price that goes up versus what you don't see is the net price growth. And in the last few years, this has become much more transparent because of whether it's been legislation in the states or federally, Require, federal requirements or because the industry basically has started providing the information on the macro level, you see that for increasing in prices on the re list, list prices has no correlation to the net prices. And in fact, in 2019, even though the list prices went up by 4.9%, the net prices actually were negative 3.1% growth. What it means is that we're giving more away in rebates and concessions or fees to entities in the supply chain than actually we're realizing in our price increases. Next slide, please. And the data I showed you, which was to one entity, is duplicated by other data points. And this one is from, uh, the second data point is IQVIA, which is very similar to that because in 2018, for the uh, list price growth was 0.5.5%, the net price was 0.3% growth, and which is well below the general inflation rate. And this has been confirmed by even pharmacy benefit managers. For example, Express Script in 2019 said that 
the 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 price uh, the trend for commercial plans which was spending increase was 2.3% increase but it was primarily driven by increasing utilization which was at 1.4% rather than the unit cost which was 0.9%. So this is conf confirming the data that's coming from IQVIA by third parties like the pharmacy benefit managers. And this negative one, uh, less than 1% 1 increase in unit cost for the commercial plan, even though the list price was increased by 5.2%. So again, this confirms something that we've seen by macro level by entities like IQVIA has been confirmed by Express Scripts. So that's why it's important to always consider not only increasing list prices, but also what is the growth in net prices. And I will show you different examples in different markets where this is occurring. The next slide, please. This is a research study, by the way. Uh, all of this data that I'm gonna share with you is publicly available. It's non-proprietary. It's something that anybody can access. And you can uh, see all the references in every slide and you can go and basically pull it up on your own and look at the information. So this is Medicare data. And what it shows in the Medicare is that the spending growth actually in Medicare Part D is slower than the rebate concessions that we give in form of rebates to the third parties actually is growing faster. And in fact, if you look at the latest trustee report from Medicare Part D, the growth in Medicare Part D spending from 2017 through 2018 was negative 5%. Just imagine, they spent less in 2018 in real dollars than they did in 2017. And that's because they considered all the rebates and concessions that was given. If they just looked at the retail prices and increase in inflation of spending on just on the gross level, they would have seen an increase in spending. But because they took into consideration all of the rebates and concessions and fees and everything else that we paid into the system, then back to the government and back to the pharmacy benefit managers and insurers, the growth was negative 5%. Next slide, please. You will hear a lot about rebates, and it's not just about rebates anymore. Rebates actually have been flat in the commercial, and this is, again, Pew Charitable Trust that did this research, has been flat over the several years. What has been growing is fees, and this is fees that are classified by the, whether it's the insurers or the pharmacy benefit managers. And this is an important point because when you listen to a lot of entities like insurers and pharmacy benefit managers, they get up and say, well, we pass on 95%, 99, 100% of the rebates back to the plant sponsor or back to the state or back to any, any other entity Medicare program. The reality is they do that, in fact, do the rebates, but the problem is that the rebates have been replaced by fees and they retain, if not all, but lion's share of those fees and those are not passed back to the plant sponsor. Next slide, please. So what has we have ended up is that in 2018, and I have more recent data in 2019, about $166 billion was passed back into the system after all of the spending was done. So in 2018, which is the latest slide, uh, data on this slide, but I will share with you the 2019 data, in the United States, we spent $482 billion in pharmaceuticals. That includes retail drugs and also drugs that are administered in hospitals as well in physician offices and through uh, infusions. Out of that, $166 billion was packed, passed back in form of concessions and rebates back to whether it was the insurers or the pharmacy benefit managers. So that's about 34% was replaced and pushed back. In 2019, that 166 billion has grown to 100, grew to 175 billion. And that was about a 5% increase, but more importantly, drug spending in the United States didn't grow by 5%. So the rebates and the concessions that we pay back are actually outpacing the growth in spending. Next slide, please. But it's not just about rebates and fees that they charge the pharmaceutical industry. 
The pharmacy benefit managers also charge pharmacies a fee called the IR fee, which goes basically and it gets lost into the system. That number is significantly smaller. It's not 175 billion, but it's about 9.1 billion that was charged in 2018. And this just involved the Medicare program. Next slide, please. Both the governor and doctor mentioned insulin. And insulin is the poster child of what is wrong with the system currently as we see it. Regarding insulin, if you just looked at the retail price increases, and this is just one example that was provided by Eli Lilly of Humalog, the increase has been astronomical. It has gone up from 391 up to about $600 per vial of Humalog. But the more important thing that you need to look at is not the retail price, but the net price, which is it's basically stayed flat and actually gone down in real numbers. So even though the price increases have been going on per insulin, the net price has stayed stable and it has gone down. Now, why is this important? Because unlike any other entity in the healthcare system, whether you go see the doctor or you go to a hospital or you go to an optometrist or a dentist, when patients show up to the pharmacy Farm counter and the doctor mentions, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of background noise. Can you guys please mute your phones? Thank you. So when the patient shows up at the pharmacy counter, their coinsurance, and he, she mentioned about how the, the benefit design has shifted from copayment to coinsurance, based on the retail price and not the net price. Why is this important? Is because as you see, if it was based on the net price, the patient out of pocket would be significantly lower than it is on the retail price. Again, I want to emphasize, this is the only entity in the healthcare system that currently when a patient wants to pay out of pocket for a co-insurance, they're paying based on the retail price, not the negotiated price that has been done on their behalf. When I go to the dentist, I'm paying based on the net price. When I go to the optometrist, I'm paying based on the net price, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. But the insulin example is not just about Humalog. It's all these other insulin manufacturers with insulin that they have available. If you look at across the board, and this is different examples of insulin, and this was a report that was done by the, by the American Action Forum, you will see that the gross increase in prices is nowhere near what the net price increases after all the concessions and rebates and fees and everything else has been paid. And you can see the different examples of the different insulins by different manufacturers in this slide. Next slide, please. It's not just about insulin. This is an example of Humira. The Humira, the pharmacy benefit managers, basically gain majority of the price increases. So the price increase from uh, $2,914 in 2014 to $5,174 in 2019. The net price increase was only 18%. The pharmacy benefit manager retention of the rebates and everything else was 611%. So yes, you do see the increase in prices, but what you need to realize is that what you need to look at is the net price increase. And more importantly, you need to change the benefit design to mirror other entities in the healthcare system where the patient does not pay according to the retail price, but rather the price that has been negotiated on their behalf at the pharmacy counter. And I want to really emphasize this because pharmaceuticals is the only entity in healthcare system that does that does not happen. And if you want to fix one thing, that's the one thing that you need to fix and we need to fix as a society, especially in the view of changing benefit designs. Next slide. So I put some series of questions and I've tried because these are the questions I always get when I testify, whether it's at hearings or at meetings or I give the uh, top, uh, discuss the topic of drug pricing and try to answer them with one data that Again, you can go and find it yourself and, um, uh, on, and by a simple Google 
or they are all documented information. So let's go to the next slide. So the one question that always comes up, what is driving out-of-pocket cost spending in the U.S. for patients for pharmaceuticals? And uh, Progressive Policy Institute, which is a progressive, as its name alludes to, think tank in D.C. did a study, and they basically figured out that the two things that drive out-of-pocket spending more than price increases for seniors is severity of illness, which is poor health, and the utilization, which is they use more drugs as they get older, as we all get older. So the out-of-pocket spending is less a function of pricing and more a function of utilization. And this actually confirms the data from Express Scripts, because if you recall, when we started this discussion, how Express Scripts said that most of spending in their plans in 2019 and their commercial plans was driven by utilization rather than price. Next slide, please. So the question becomes, what about Medicaid spending? You hear quite a bit from the state that their Medicaid spending is growing and is growing significantly. In fact, if you look at the data, that's true because according, and this is from MACPAC, which is Medicaid and CHIP Payment and uh, Access Commission. And this is their last latest report that they put out. So the data, the latest data they have is from 2017. From 2016 to 2017, the gross level spending for Medicaid went up from $61 billion to $64 billion. But look at the net spending after all the rebates, concessions, and price controls. It actually went down from 29.7 to 29.1. So when Medicaid says that they're spending more, that is true but they're collecting also more in rebates and concessions. Therefore, their net spending is actually flat. The issue becomes the question that every state governor, government should ask, what happens to those concessions? Where is that money going to? Is it going back to the Medicaid program? Is it staying in the healthcare system? Or is it going to a general fund? And those are the questions that we need to answer. But if you see from the MACPAC report, Globally, Medicaid programs are actually flat in their spending for drugs. Next slide, please. The common question I always get asked, do rebates impact list prices? So if we get rid of rebate contracting, something that has been contemplated by both the administration, current administration, and other entities, economists such as myself, have talked about and written about quite a bit. And we didn't really have a good answer until this report came out from the Schaefer Institute. In this report, they were able to show that for every dollar increase in rebate, that means every dollar I'm giving back in rebates, and this is just in rebates, not the fees, I have to increase my prices as pharmaceutical industry by $1.17. And the conclusion was that rebates do play a role in drug prices and reducing and eliminating rebates can result in lower list prices and hence lower out-of-pocket costs for patients. Because remember, going back to my or one of my earlier slides, if you reduce list prices because of the changes in benefit design, and you heard it from the, the, the doctor, the changes in benefit design, which has gone towards more core insurance, you reduce the list prices, the patient out-of-pocket costs will be also reduced. However, the better thing to do is just have the patient pay based on the net price, period, which they are not currently. Next slide, please. The other question always comes up is that what is the true impact of biopharmaceutical spending on healthcare premiums? Well, we don't need a report anymore or any kind of a modeling data because we have two years of data now coming out of California. The California Department of Managed Healthcare puts out a report based on Senate Bill 17 that they passed that shows what is the percentage of premium that goes towards pharmaceutical spending in the state of California. And this is based on data that has been provided by insurers and pharmacy benefit managers to the state. On aggregate, for every $100 spent on premium, $12.7 goes towards pharmaceuticals. This is 
much lower number than you will hear publicly said by insurers and by pharmacy benefit managers, which is they will say something between 25 and 30 percent goes towards drug spending. This is actual data. You can go look up the report, and the latest one was just filed a few months ago. And this two years of data, and it's very consistent because the first year it showed 12.9%, the next year was 12.7%. And eliminating rebate contracting does not impact premium as much as people say it does. Look at the information again from California. Rebate impact on premium was negative 1.5%. So if you eliminate rebate contracting, which we will get to of why you should, you will only impact premiums by 1.5%. And it's a one-time shot. And again, I will ask you to go look at that report and read it carefully. It has a lot of good information in there. Next slide, please. The other question I commonly get asked, and it's publicly I already discussed it, is that what percentage of concessions do PBMs pass back to the plan sponsor or the patient? This is a big question because a lot of states want to know, and a lot of states have passed legislation asking the PBMs to furnish them data to see where does the money go. You will hear publicly that the PBMs will claim that they pass almost 100%, 90, 90, between 90 and 100% of the concessions back, rebates back or concessions back to the plan sponsors. Well, we no longer have to guess because Texas, they have the House Bill 2536 that passed, has started collecting this information. And in fact, in 2019, they passed less than 80% of the concessions back to the plan sponsor and only 2% back to the patient. So it's not the 90%, 95% that you will hear publicly or 100%. It's closer to 80%. So they're retaining a lot of the dollars. And in fact, if, I will ask you to go look at this report as well, because in 2019, the pharmacy benefit managers collected more in dollars in rebates and concessions than they actually passed back to the plan sponsors. Next slide, compared to 2018. Next slide. So the question becomes, how much do patients save if PBM share the savings? get rid of rebates or make the, have the patient pay based on the net price? That's a question, right? That's a good question to ask and we need the answers for. Well, Optum actually has done this program. They have allowed patients to benefit from all of the concessions that have been done, all of the negotiated concessions that have been done on their, uh, on their behalf at the point of sale at the pharmacy. According to Optum's data, consumers, are saving an average of $130 per eligible prescription in 2019. That's $130 per prescription. It's over $1,000, $1,400 per year just for one drug that they're taking. This is average per prescription. They not only said that, but the program also finds because of the lower out-of-pocket cost for patients, there's an increase of 16% in adherence. That means patients are paying less out of pocket and they're becoming much more adherent with their medicine. So this is not some unconsequential number that we're talking about. Patients do in fact will save money if at the point of sale at the pharmacy, the discounts and the rebates and the concessions and the fees are shared with them and not put back into some black hole that nobody sees. And this is one of the easiest simplest way you can address the out-of-pocket costs for patients because of what the doctor said, which is the changes in benefit design that have switched from a co-payment, which was a flat fee, to more of a co-insurance, which is a percentage. Have them pay based on net price. Next slide, please. Are generic prices increasing? in the United States, are they out of control? You hear that quite a bit. Actually, I heard that a lot about five years ago. The reality is, and this is a study that was done by University of Chicago. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and this uh, study showed that in the last, I would say, 
10 years because they looked at 2007 to 2017, generic prices actually have depreciated by 80%. But listen to this, even though the prices have dropped 80%, patient out-of-pocket costs for generics actually have only dropped by 50%. So in other words, in a market that is highly commoditized, patients are not benefiting from the price decreases as much as they should. And that was the conclusion. Con consumers are not fully benefiting from the generic price decline. And this is important. Why is this important? And why is it a pharmaceutical company who manufactures and innovates brand drugs? Why are we concerned about generics? Because for every dollar spent out of pocket, unnecessarily, that's not a good thing. We need to have a look at the entire market, not just the branded, but also the generic market as well. Next slide, please. Do patients and states overpay for their prescription medicines? That's another question I always get asked. Well, let's address the states first. There's an issue called spread pricing, and some of your states that are neighboring states have already looked into this very carefully, Kentucky and Ohio being two of them, but New York, Florida, Texas have looked at this. What is spread pricing? Is that when a pharmacy benefit manager charges a different amount from the state rather than what they reimburse the pharmacy, that's called spread. It occurs only in the generic market, but it's significant dollar amounts. In Ohio in 2017, the Medicaid program overpaid by 224 million. In Kentucky, it was over 100 million in the same year. So you gotta look at whether or not your state is being impacted by spread pricing. And again, why is this important? Because it's unnecessary spending in a commoditized market. So how do patients overpay? Well, again, there was a study or an idea of clawback. This is when, even with a copayment, patients may be overpaying for their medicine when they show up to the pharmacy counter. In this study, which was done by the Schaefer Institute and looked at the database of a, a large retail pharmacy chain over a one year period. One out of four prescriptions, when a patient showed up at the pharmacy counter, they overpaid for their medicine compared to what if they would have paid for in cash. And this ended up having increased in out of pocket overpayment by patients of $135 million over that one year period. In just that one study, in that one retail chain pharmacy. One out of four prescriptions, every time a patient takes out its insurance card, they're overpaying for their medicine. This is called the phenomenon of clawback. How do you fix that? The way Pfizer has done it for me, and 50% of employees have done for their employees. When I show up to the pharmacy counter, I pay what the pharmacist is being reimbursed. This overpayment is not kept by the pharmacist. This is why it's called clawback. It's clawed back by the pharmacy benefit manager. So when I show up to the pharmacy counter as a Pfizer employee, because of the benefit design I have, I pay what the pharmacist is being reimbursed, not what my copayment is. If my copayment is higher, uh, than what is he's being re, he or she's being reimbursed, I pay the lower amount. If they're being reimbursed at a higher level, then I pay my copayment. But as you see, one out of four times, patients are overpaying for their medicines. Next slide, please. The question, does rebate contracting create misaligned incentives? Well, there are three examples, actually, I'm gonna give you. And first one, yes, it's in the hepatitis market. So the, the manufacturer of the hepatitis uh, C, Sovaldi, decided to release an authorized generic of this medicine. What is an authorized generic? Authorized generic is basically the same exact drug that comes out of the same manufacturing facility with the same pro exact product from the same manufacturer, most often, that is priced as a generic. And the generic for this medicine, Sovaldi, was priced about 80% below the retail price of the brand name drug. Guess what happened because of what, when you rebate, uh, you remove, uh, you price it at 80% below, you don't give any more rebates. 
Guess what happened in the commercial market? There was hardly ever a pickup, and also Part D market, of the Sovaldi authorized generic, even though there was identical drug. Why? Because rebate contracting creates misaligned incentives where the insurers and the PBMs want to have higher price medicines with higher rebates rather than lower net prices and lower price medicines. And that's why it's causing a misincentives in the marketplace for pharma companies who come out with their medicines. We, when we lower, we price our medicines below what's the market leader, we're told, no, 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 no. Go increase your price, give us more rebates, and you will get on formulary. And this has been confirmed two other places, biosimilars, and many of you may have heard about. On average, biosimilars is about 25 to 30% below price, whether you look at net price with ASP or even the retail price, which we don't have any retail drugs yet on the biosimilar market, but ASP is about 25 to 30%. A study that was published in JAMA, 17 of the largest health plans covered biosimilars as preferred, 17, in only 14% of their formulary decisions, and in 33% of the cases, they, they were designated as non-preferred by the insurers, even though they were about 20 to 25 to 30% below price of the originator. Again, misaligned incentives. And finally, the last data point, a study that was funded and published in JAMA, funded by the Arnold Foundation, they found that 72% of Part D formularies had a lower cost-sharing tier and 30% of Part D formularies had fewer utilization controls on branded drugs for at least one multi-source drug. So even though you had a brand medicine that had generics which were multi-source, so multiple generic companies were making it, in 72% of Part D formularies, in at least one instance, that brand name drug was preferred over the multi-source generics. Again, why? Because of rebate. Rebate contracting creates misaligned incentives, and it creates an environment that higher price, higher rebated drugs are preferred over lower price alternatives. Next slide, please. Do PBMs control coverage, access, and distribution? That has become much more relevant because of the specialty pharmacy space. space. Majority of the brand name drugs in this country now are called specialty drugs, and they're being dispensed through specialty pharmacies. But if you look at the data, the four top PBMs own about 80% of the share, 75% of the share of specialty pharmacy business. So not only do PBMs have control over coverage because they develop the coverage decisions or benefit design, not only they control access because they do step therapy, prior authorization, and everything else, which, by the way, they get paid from both sides of the aisle, but they also now manage distribution through their specialty pharmacies. So they have a monopolistic environment where they have both access, coverage, and distribution now under their control. Last slide, please. So we've talked quite a bit about potential solutions. And we need potential solutions because frankly, that's what you guys are all here about. So for immediate fix, and this is going back to what the doctor said, what the governor said, we need to start sharing the savings directly with the patients at the point of sale, at the pharmacy counter. They have to be able to pay based on net price when they have a coinsurance or a deductible, not the retail price, which is inflated especially in areas like insulin and other drugs that are retail medicine. This is not a negligible savings, as you saw from the Optum data. On average, the savings was $130 per prescription, based on their own information and improved adherence. So that's number one for immediate fix. Long-term fix, get rid of rebate contracting. It creates misaligned incentives. The administration has tried to do this in the Part D space, they pulled back, but now there are rumors that they're going to go back and try to revive it again. And this is important because not because contracting is a bad thing. You want competition. You want blinded bidding. But there's a reason why entities like Kaiser do net price contracting. They don't do rebate contracting. And hence, when you look at Kaiser's formulary, they want lower price alternatives. 
why they are using biosimilars at 80, 90% of the clip versus the rest of the country is using it at 20, 30% of the clip. Long-term fix, mandate fees for services instead of percent of retail price. Right now, fees that are charged from pharma companies or from pharmacists or so on and so forth are a percentage based on the retail price. This causes misaligned incentives. Fees has to be flat fees and they have to be legitimate fees that are being charged, not some made up data consolidation. And there are some legitimate fees. Let, let us pay for that. And that's another thing that the Health and Human Services Rebate Reform Program was trying to fix beyond just getting uh, through and not having rebate contracting. The fourth, ensure price, lower price alternatives are preferred and not the other way around. You as entities within the state have a responsibility to look at the formularies of your state employee programs, your Medicaid program, your state retired programs, and look at where there are issues like was published in JAMA, where a brand name drug is preferred over multi-source generics, where a biosimilars is not preferred over a branded biologic. You can do that. Beware of monopolies in the supply chain. We talked about that. And finally, keep pharmaceutical industries feet to the fire. Their models that are developed, it just takes time, it takes effort, but make sure you only pay for a drug when there's a positive outcome. You can do that. The drugs currently being developed are not being developed for massive populations. They're very niche drugs for rare diseases and small po patient populations that can be done uh, and reviewed and followed through very easily. Make sure you're paying for outcomes. You're not just paying for the drug. Make sure you have contracting in place as a state that says, if this drug doesn't perform as it is, and if it's used appropriately and doesn't pro provide the outcomes that, it, that the patient requires, then I'm gonna get my money back. With that said, I'm gonna stop and entertain any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Popovi, and really appreciate that presentation. A lot of good information. Um, I guess one, General question I have, you know, we've heard, I see a lot of other presentations from other entities in the supply chain and, uh, you know, it, it had seemed that a lot of the other entities were saying so much of the, uh, the drug price and especially excessive drug pricing of prescription medication is being driven by uh, manufacturers and the list price and we really have no control over that. But it seems like you're saying manufacturers don't want to necessarily be increasing that list price higher and higher, but they're almost being uh, forced to just given the way the rebate contracting mechanisms work. Okay, and Nathan, that's a great question because the thing that you need to think about is that when I started in this in industry, about 40% of the market was branded medicines and about 60% was generic. Now it's about 90, 10. So every brand company is working on smaller pie to be able to make money. And we're working in much more competitive areas, such as arthritis is a good example, insulin is another one. Uh, so what has happened is that, yes, we are increasing our prices and they're absolutely right. We set the list prices, we increase the list prices. But as you saw from data, and it's not just from one data source, we're giving actually back into the system at a much higher clip. That's why you're seeing these negative numbers. And every company has, in the, and I can share with you that Pfizer basically has said the same thing. We've had a negative price growth in the last two to, two to three years. So we're basically, our price increases are not keeping up with the rebates and everything else. So that's why I implore you, if you're gonna do one thing, and I know it's difficult for a state to do it, but to support the idea of getting re rid of rebate contracting. It's not the end and be all, trust me. It's not gonna fix the system overnight, but it's gonna be the step in the right direction to create incentives in the marketplace for pharma companies like Pfizer to reduce their prices or bring dr drugs that are lower priced and those are preferred rather than higher priced alternatives. Look at the Kaiser model. Kaiser does not use a PBM. They don't do rebate contracting. Look at their biosimilar usage. In that, in that entity, 
versus the general usage in other insurers. Okay, thank you for that. So Janet, uh, looks like you have a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I am a pharmacist and I own a community pharmacy in Baraboo. And my question is, the other things that we've heard so far in the presentations, we talk about if we decrease um, rebates or decrease spread pricing or things like that, then that will just increase prices in um, insurance, uh, um, copay, or not premium. copay, but premiums and things like that, that the prices will just get pushed to something else. What's your answer to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I go back to the California report, right? So look at the California report that has been put out for the last two years. This is information from the insurers and the pharmacy benefit managers about the impact of pharmaceutical spending on premiums. And look at the rebate level. If you eliminate rebate contracting right now, which you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. All you're doing is impacting premiums with 1.5%. That's it. And it's a one-time shot because if you re reduce it, it's basically eliminated. It's basically shot at 1.5% of the premiums. It's not the 20%. It's not the 30%. It's not the 40% that you hear in the public domain. Getting rid of misaligned incentives has minuscule effect on premiums. Go look at that California report closely. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Brian Stam, looks like you have a couple questions. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Brian. Okay, excellent. Dr. Pobovian, thank you so much for um, joining us today and for sharing all that information. It's it's great to hear your perspective on this. You certainly have a lot of history and experience in this area, so it's great for us to absorb that. So thank you, uh, first off. Um, I've got a couple of questions, and bear with me. You're the first representative that we have from a major uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry, so some of these... Um, it might be bent up a little bit. Um, you mentioned specifically that we're looking to do that. You I actually wrote this down from what you said that you're looking to do data driven policy discussion. And I think the data that you've shared here is very clear and, and it's what we've been seeing over and over again throughout these discussions. What I was hoping to look for, especially coming from Pfizer or any big pharma or manufacturer was data specific to the cost of actually manufacturing and distributing the drug themselves. Because I think, you know, the main argument that we're gonna see at the end of this is, you could have, you know, a distribution channel on a PBM and a pharmacy all making, you know, small percentages on to, to, to stay in business. However, the overall argument is that the drug from the manufacturer is outrageously priced in the first place. So how do we look at this from a policy perspective if the data behind that is largely hidden? That's, that's a great question. So a couple of things to absorb. Number one, um, of the price that has been set for, and this goes back to the, I think my third slide that talked about what percentage actually goes back to the supply chain versus it gets retained by pharmaceutical industry. So it's about 54, 46%. But the question that you're asking is very important because what you're saying is that, how do you come up with that list price from the beginning, right, yep. Brian? Yep, yep, yeah. that's exactly what I'm asking. And it's not just a function of R&D. That's very important for you to note because there was a study that was done and it was published by independent researchers. And it said, well, you know, the cost of developing a drug is not really 2.5 billion. It's closer to about 500 million or 600 million dollars. And that's a big discrepancy. But one of the things that they left out is that all of the investment that goes into failures and all of the investment that goes for the future research that has to be done. And when you add up all those things, that's how we come up with the price. In addition, what we're looking at is other things in the marketplace when we set the price. It's not just about the R&D and the a revenue loss for all the research that has been done or will be done with failures and so on and so forth or future research. One of the other things that we look at is that if I bring drug X into the market, how much do I have to pay back on rebates? How much I have to pay back on fees? What, what market dynamics are there out there in the marketplace with regards to how they're going to control utilization with regards to prioritization and so forth? 
how much do I have to provide on those things? So it's a very complicated model. And I would tell you that one of the things that we do have is a very data-driven price setting model internally, but you need to ask that from individual products for people to come and explain to you how they came up with the drug price. And they will do that. It's not, it's not some big national secret, but you need to ask, but it has to be on individual medicines because what I'm giving you is just the macro level issues that goes into the thought process. But each product is very different. Um, the other thing you have to take note, and I've been in industry for, since 19, working in the pharmaceutical research industry since 1993 when I went into my residency. I've been involved with launch, with Pfizer, I've been involved in launch of six products. That means six products that FDA approved, we brought into the market. Okay, I'm not even talking about things that died in the lab and early in development. Of those six medicines, only three of them are still in the marketplace. Two of them were withdrawn because of safety reasons after we found out that product was used more massively in the market. One of them was because there was no market for it. It was inhaled insulin, actually, that I was involved in. So all of those things have to be added up in, on the macro level when we come up price. The other thing that people don't appreciate, and this is very important for you guys all to know, we just don't do individual drug prices within our portfolio. The way Pfizer looks at it, it says, okay, I need to price this medicine because I know the utilization and the access will be different than the five other medicines that I'm using. I'm basically have it in the market. It's for small patient population. I'm never going to get money return on investment on. And therefore, I need to put more emphasis on how do I price it more appropriately on this one to be able to make the money to make up for the portfolio. Entire portfolio. So what we call it is portfolio pricing, unfortunately. So that's another thing that you need to think about when you ask these questions. It's not just about the individual product that's in price. So to, to, I guess, to build on that, so let's say we're talking about Ibrance, which is a, uh, it's a Pfizer uh, product. Absolutely. Now that in general costs $13,000 for a course, and we're talking about $156,000 a year for that. Am I, as a consumer, able to go to Pfizer and ask, or at least see when I'm purchasing, and maybe this is an idea to throw out there, and, and I think what we're looking for is, is new ideas. A lot of what you proposed here uh, certainly is things that we should be looking at, but it's also things that we've heard from the PBMs, from the pharmacies and whatnot. But I, as a consumer, would be really, I think, uh, I, would, I would appreciate it if I could, when I buy a prescription. If I go and I got a, a prescription for $100, okay, and in with when my receipt, I could see an actual breakdown of how much of that $100 went to the pharmacy, went to the distribution channel, went to the PBM, and went to the manufacturer. That's the kind of thing I think that we're looking for for this, and I just feel that if I need to, as a consumer, go to every single manufacturer and talk about an individual drug and then try and understand portfolio pricing, all of which this data is essentially, it's, it's your data and you have no reason to share it because it's just proprietary. How are we supposed to make policy decisions on this if, if there's so many hidden niches? Right. So, so you asked, Brian, the first question, let me address your first question, which is sure. the, uh, you asked, of the $100 that I'm paying, how much is it going to pharma company? How much is it going to the pharmacy? How much is it going to the, you know, uh, wholesaler versus the insurer versus the PBM? That, that information is actually coming out more and more publicly. And that's why I always point to the Texas data with the legislation that they passed, because the question that the Texas legislators asked them is, okay, you're collecting all this information, all this money, right? What percentage are you passing back to the plant sponsor? And what percentage are you paying, passing back to the patient? And those are the type of legislation that is bringing more transparency in the marketplace of where this money is going. You know, who's benefiting from this? And I think you're right. The question should be, of the $100, what percentage goes to this entity, that entity? We have it on the macro level, but individual drug level is much more difficult to do it. And I'll tell you why it's a little bit more difficult on individual drug level. 
Because at some point, you will get into a place that you want to make sure that there's still blinded bidding going on, that you're reducing the price. To a, uh, and that's uh, economic theory 101. If I don't know what you're bidding, I'm going to bid lower. So you want to keep some secrecy, but on the macro level, you are starting to see this data coming out. And I've got one more question for you, and then I'll let you go. Okay, this sure. one should be helpful. No problem. Does, does Pfizer have an insulin drug themselves? I, I don't honestly know. We, no, unfortunately, I, we used to have an inhaled insulin, which didn't work out. That's and I was the medical director on it. No. Um, we don't. So I've, I've got a question. So if insulin is a problem, and we heard that asthma medication is a problem, there's a couple other categories of drugs that we know are problems, yeah. right? Then the governor mm -hmm. talked about it. We've heard it over and over again. Right. What is stopping Pfizer from creating an insulin product and marketing it and having, you know, Phil Nicholson, who I know is on your commercials a couple of times, going up and saying, we manufacture this drug for $20. We make 3% on it. We're advertising for 23. If you're paying anything more than $50 on it, you're getting ripped off. And saying that on a commercial to consumers, so they actually understand the pricing model that you guys have built in. Because I feel if I'm a consumer and I saw that kind of level of transparency, if I had diabetes and needed that drug, I would absolutely choose your product over any other product. Why, why, is, why have we not seen a, a movement on something like that? So number one, uh, the reason that you don't see pharma companies like having huge disease portfolios that they work on is because of scientific, I would say, expertise internally. Pfizer just has never had. We've had oral medicine. When I started with Pfizer, we used to have Glucotrol, I believe, which was an oral medicine for type 2 diabetes, but we never had insulin. And really the research and capabilities are very different. You know, Pfizer has transitioned itself. When I started Pfizer, it was an infectious disease company and a cardiovascular company and a mental health company. And it has transitioned itself very slowly over the last two decades and becoming more of an oncology and immunology company. You know, so that's why nobody can jump in and start manufacturing and making insulin. Now, the second part of your question is that Go, if, can, can we rewind the slides and go to the Humalog slide by any chance with the insulin pricing? Go back, go back, go back, go back. It's, you have to go back, 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 go back. Okay, stop. All right. No, no, no. go back to the, to the previous one that you had. Perfect, leave it. Okay, Brian, this is the problem. If a patient has a coinsurance, most coinsurances are about 20%, right? In the marketplace, 20, maybe 30%, let's say 20%. And the insulin price in 2018, the net price for insulin was $135. So 20% of 135 is what, $25, right? Yeah. If you're paying more than $25 out of pocket, you're being ripped in your coinsurance. If you're paying more than $25 on your copay for Humalog, you're probably overpaying. This is the problem. If the patient out-of-pocket cost, and the doctor alluded to it, was based on the net price, patients would save money. And this is, again, going back to the Optum study that they did, their own program, that the average savings was $130 per prescription, per patient. So that's the problem. We need to make sure that the numbers are correct, but we're seeing more and more of this type of data. And you could say as a state, if my patients are paying for Humalog, based on the 2018 data, I'm sure that Lily has more 2019 data. If a patient is paying more than $30 for copay or coinsurance, they're overpaying. Right now, the patient, which is the top line, they're paying based on the top line, which is 30% of 600 is $180 right? Or 20% is $120, not 20 and $30. And that's the problem. In nowhere else, and keep that in mind, nowhere else in the healthcare system, Brian, when you walk into your dentist's office, you're pay, paying based on 135, not based on 600. Somehow or another, we've been able to do this program for all other healthcare in industry except for pharmaceuticals. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.
Oh, good. Thanks for those questions, Brian. Uh, Alan, you have a couple questions? Yes, thank you. Dr. Popovia and Alan Lukashevsky from uh, Shared Service Organization, New Gen, that houses two insulin um, <laughs> insurance plans. Why is insulin on my mind? But anyway, uh, Health Tradition, a for-profit HMO, and WEA Trust, uh, which is a not-for-profit uh, insurer formed by teachers in 1970. You had mentioned that what is driving out-of-pocket spending is poor health and also utilization. Can you list the factors that are driving utilization, higher utilization? It's, it's, it's primarily poor health. I mean, as we get older, we use more medicines. That's, that's a given. Uh, uh, if you look at, on, um, and this goes back, Medicare patients, 90% of Medicare patients who are 65 and older use at least one chronic medicine, at least one per year. If you look at age, it's, as you go up in age, the number of medicines is increasing. And that's just because we get older, we have more ailments, and frankly, you know, we sometimes don't take care of ourselves, and uh, we just need more medicines to keep us alive and healthy. And that's the nature of the nature of uh, the biology of the human being. I mean, there's no secret about it, but it's good to see it documented. But it also shows that when Express Scripts, it sort of corroborates the data that's coming out of PBM, which is spending increase for their commercial plans was primarily driven by utilization, not prices. Thank you. Um, doesn't pharma marketing drive a lot of the utilization? Um, to drive up sales, and, and that's part of an essential component of business to maintain your profit line and growth every year, correct? I think pharma marketing helps educate and inform people who, have, who basically are not aware of some of the benefits. But ultimately what drives utilization is somebody who is diagnosing and writing the prescription, but more often than not, and unfortunately that is the truth, is the benefit design and the formulary of that patient has. So a pharma company can promote anything they want. Physician, in most, unfortunately, in most cases, can prescribe anything that they feel is right for the patient, but ultimately what the decision maker and what the patient ends up getting is a decision by the insurer, the PBM, who's making those coverage decisions. But I understand that, that in order to drive to lowest net cost and as an insurer, uh, we will pass all rebates through to lower premium. Um, so there's, there is a legitimate fee that goes to PBMs, but in order to get lowest rebate, pharma also insists upon certain utilization criteria, uh, perhaps not uh, the tightest, like in the diabetes space, which is probably a good place to focus on since that seems to be a disease of our society based on lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, we see polypharmacy, so it's not a singular drug cost. I refer to as drug cost burden, the multiple medications people have to take with multiple out-of-pocket expenditures, either as co-insurance or individual co-pays. Uh, so what we're seeing though is, is um, a lot of pushing and driving utilization based on financial incentives and maybe not the best evidence from what I've learned. Uh, for example, take Victoza uh, in short, um, well, when you look at the data and going through their medical liaison who explained it to me and you understand absolute risk reduction, we have to treat 63 people for three years at a cost of $5.3 million to prevent one cardiovascular event, which is why we should be doing all this. When I can do that with metformin and weight loss and treating hypertension and probably do it for a few thousand dollars and do it for 10 people. So the point being that driving utilization that's inefficient is not a solution to this, this pharmaceutical spend. We also have issues with, I don't know what's going on between pharma and FDA, but some drug companies submitting data that's questionable. You can f uh, read about it quite well in a book called Rigor Mortis by a medical science writer, Richard Harris, very good read. Uh, but in short, uh, the, the question being that a lot of studies are not reproducible. We see kind of the evidence of that with CAR-T therapies. They were supposed to be successful 76% of the time, not even 33% success at UW. Their statement is, we are disappointed with CAR-T therapies. Lastly, Radicava for ALS, 
actually falsely uh, submitted data in the statistical method, when you correct for it, all you get is total randomness, meaning there is no drug effect. So the whole problem with value is not just the unit drug cost, it's the utilization, what's driving it, and the fact that we just don't have value in all of our drugs on the market. We should not be promoting drugs that basically are not driving positive outcomes, because all they can do then is increase costs and cause harm. Any comments to that? Well, uh, number one, if you notice what I told you guys at the end, uh, especially with this uh, new disease areas that is being investigated, which is much more, much more smaller patient population, what individuals like states can do, and some states are starting to get involved in this, is to pay for outcomes and keep the pharmaceutical feet to the fire. If you don't get the outcomes, you don't pay for it. However, I want to go back to your comment about premiums. And if we don't, if we pass on this thing to the premiums are going to increase. And this is something that going back to Janet's question, um, premiums impact on rebates, rebates on premiums is minuscule and it's overblown and it's overblown by in entities within the marketplace. who don't want to replace rebate contracting with net price contracting. And they've been telling this story over and over again. But we don't have to guess anymore what the impact of rebates are on premiums. If we pass back the rebates to the patients, we know patients are going to save money, basically, according to the Optum data. We know patients will have, be more adherent with their medicine. But more importantly, we know that the impact on premium is minuscule. And go look at the California report. It's not... Pfizer report, it's or not an industry system. report. This is the in report that was generated based on data from insurers and PBMs. So and one, one last thing, one last thing about the FDA comments. I believe that the FDA is more rigorous than any other regulatory body I've dealt with them on drug approvals than any other regulatory body in, this, in the globally. They do a fantastic job. And as I mentioned, Sometimes you don't know what you don't know with medicines. And I was involved with six product launches and three of them were no longer in the marketplace because we found out things afterwards with broader utilization. And that's, a, that's the nature of science and that's the nature of basically doing research. You just don't know everything and you cannot anticipate everything. We've also found out after things come out in the market that they have additional benefits than we initially knew. I was involved, uh, a friend of mine actually was involved in developing sildenafil for treatment of pulmonary hypertension. This product was not being used for pulmonary hypertension. Many of you know sildenafil is Viagra. But researchers started using it, and then Pfizer invested money into developing it, even though it's not a big market, to develop it for treatment of pulmonary hypertension. So we learned both post-benefit and post-risk after approval by the regulatory folks. Um, one comment you mentioned about the impact on premium of rebates, if you were to go to a net list price, which I'm all for it about getting total transparency up front with certain controls. I, I, I just know that in the insurance business, uh, because of pooling effect and how you run the business to manage risk, I don't think it's that simple where you can do that. Uh, I'm not the actuary or the underwriter, but I know that's why there's a pooling effect in the distribution of uh, rebate credits from administrative expenses across the uh, book of business in order to how you manage that. And, and I know we don't know for certain what the impact is. Uh, there are actuarial assessments that said uh, premium can go any from a negative 2% or up to 24% over the course of 10 years. And since it hasn't happened, we don't know the reality behind it. So there's several actuarial assessments with varying degrees of prediction. So we don't know what would happen, but I'm all for trying to get to a lower upfront net cost and get greater layers of transparency. But we still need to manage utilization because 30% of our resources are not driving the value and the outcomes that we really need. And we can put those to better use. So, so let me address the premium again. We, I'm, a, I'm an economist, so I'm used to doing modeling. The, uh, economists just love modeling. Simulation models, actuaries actually do modeling too all the time. We're in the same boat. 
We don't need modeling in this case. We have actual data that's been provided to the state of California over two years. So we don't need, we no longer need to guess. We don't need to estimate. We don't need to look at actuarial numbers. This is real data that was provided by insurers and pharmacy benefit managers to the state of California, and it's published publicly. And I would ask you to go and look at that report because it's clear what the impact of rebates is if you get rid of rebates on premiums. And it's not negative and it's not 30% positive. It's really 1.5%, and it's stayed at 1.5% for the last two years. And hopefully the state will continue collecting this data. I believe they would because the law is passed, and we shall see what happens. And the utilization, you're right. I mean, utilization should be done, but there are also bad incentives in the market that is driving utilization of more higher price medicines because of higher rebates rather than the other way around. Oh, I agree with that. And I can't comment on what's going on in California. <clears throat> I don't know uh, to the depth that you do and if that would apply to other states, but thank you for that information. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan, appreciate it. So we do have uh, three more people who have questions. So if we could try to move this along, I wanna make sure everyone gets a chance to speak, but obviously we still have a lot of ground to cover yet today. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through the last three and then we'll We'll cut off the questions here and um, start the next presentation. But Brent, I know you had a question. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Uh, Brent Eberle, Chief Pharmacy Officer at Navitas Health Solutions. I wanted to get back to your comment about net price contracting versus rebate contracting, and if you could explain that. And then as you're explaining that, would a potential solution be extending the 340B price as that net price to more uh, pharmacies and thus more payers? So I'm, I'm not going to comment on 340 because that's a separate federal program that is sort of like a different entity. But let me talk about net price contracting versus rebate contracting. Rebate contracting is a tactic, right? Nobody's telling the world. I'm not saying it. Pfizer's not saying it. Industry's not saying it, that there should not be negotiation and contracting that should be done between industry as well as insurers, PBMs, employers, whoever is doing the negotiation. But what we're saying is that get rid of the rebate because what they do, what rebate contracting does, and there's several examples I have presented, it creates misaligned incentives for more expensive medicines to be preferred over lower price medicines because of the rebate issue. And net price contracting is not something that has dropped off from Mars that nobody is doing. Kaiser is doing net price contracting. Therefore, when you look at um, uh, their formularies, what you see is that things like biosimilars are preferred over branded biologics versus the other way around. And that was so, documented in the JAMA sorry. article I shared with you. I just want to get so, sure understanding that when you're saying net ahead. price contracting versus rebate contracting, it's still rebate contracting, but negotiating to the lowest net cost. So you're not preferring higher net cost items. Is that how you're differentiating those two strategies? No, the way I differentiate it is that you get to a net price <clears throat> and there's no back and forth, right? So right now, the way it works is I sell the drug for $100 or you pay $100 for the drug, I rebate back $50, right? For every time that there's a transaction, there's money lost, first of all, and there's a fee. And you should know this because you're, you got, you're in the PBM business and you know about this stuff. But there are entities, and again, going back to your PBM Navitas, who does more transparent contracting, as well as Capital RX, which I'm on a board of advisors, who believe in just going to the final net price. No more back and forth on, oh, yeah, I'll pay $100, but I'll rebate back 50 Same thing happens in the Medicaid program, and that's what I mean. You negotiate toward net price, and that's it. That's the net price. There are no more fees involved in the transactional fees. There's no more going back and forth. There's no more, you know, if you use this much money, it use, you'll, you have this much utilization, you get this much rebate back. That's not the way it works anymore. You go to one set price and that's it. You negotiate to that level and it could be done in a blinded manner. Okay, thank you. So it is a, it's a type of, is it, would it be fair to say that net price contracting is just a type of rebate contracting? There's still a negotiated discount that's coming back, but instead of a, a discount off of the wholesale acquisition cost. It's just a pre-negotiated unit cost. It's a pre-negotiated unit cost, that period. That's all you pay as an entity, as an insurer. 
you don't pay $100 and you get back $50 back. That's not the way it works. You just pay 50. That's it. Sorry, then the last, would that violate best price in any way or would that net kind of, that doesn't have best price implications? It, it really, I mean, the best price implications with Medicaid and you're talking about Medicaid, correct? That's what you were talking about. That's really an entity of how low you go with regards to the net price. I mean, if you go below the best price, yeah, you violate it. But as a company, you know what your Medicaid prices are. So you're probably not, never going to go below or to the net price of uh, that best price. Because with rebate contracting, technically, you can get to the best price too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate that. Uh, Two more here to go. Lisa, you had a question? Yeah, hi, Dr. Popovian. Thanks so much. This has been really interesting for me and I'll preface this by saying I'm not a pharmacist. I don't work for insurance companies or PBMs or any of that. So much of this is um, relatively new information for me. I work at AARP and so think about the consumers at the end, those who are standing behind that pharmacy counter. And I think my takeaway from your presentation seems to be if we were going to a net price model, if that's what consumers were paying, this negotiated model, that seems to be the answer for everything. So my questions might seem kind of simplistic. Um, I'm wondering in that, um, what happens then to the list price? Um, and what happens to the price to those people who don't have insurance? Does this mean that manufacturers are gonna be lowering you know, that list price for people without insurance? Um, so I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Then I'm also wondering um, what you think about proposals that some states are moving to and, and even Medicare about um, just putting a cap on certain drugs, mostly insulin at this point. But I'm wondering if you could comment on that as well. So let me address the first part, which is what I'm saying in not this is not going to apply to every medicine, right? Because there are medicines that you really don't have to go to a net price because Patients are already, you know, there's a copay involved and there is no, it's a flat fee, right? So this only involves in insurance design when there's a coinsurance or a deductible involved for the patient. And right now, the way it's set up in the system for pharmaceuticals, the coinsurance or deductible is based on the retail price. In certain medicines, insulin being the poster child everybody's been talking about, if patients pay based on net price, there will be savings, period. I don't care what anybody says. There will be savings. There will be savings for seniors. There will be savings for the commercial patients. So net price works in certain classes. You can't look at drugs as a monolithic marketplace, right? There's many other entities. So in certain cases, like insulin, if you go to net price, uh, your coinsurance being based on net price, you will save money, number one. Uh, with regards to capping out-of-pocket costs uh, for certain medicines, I think it's a good thing. Um, except that you need to have the right number for the cap, right? Because you don't want the cap to be like $100 and the patient's still overpaying. Remember, because even with co-pays, in cases of clawback, patients may overpay. So every time, I, it's happened to me. I'll, I'll give you one example, if you bear with me. So my, my daughter needed an antibiotic about two years ago. I went to the pharmacy and it's a re retail chain drugstore that didn't have my insurance information in there. So this prescription, my generic out-of-pocket copay for Pfizer is $15. I walked into the counter and I think $20, sorry. I walked up to the counter because they didn't have my insurance information. They told me my out-of-pocket cost was gonna be $18. So I'm going, I'm saving $2 now without using my insurance card because if I use my insurance card, I was supposed to pay $20 for the generic. But I knew that within Pfizer's benefit plan, I pay what the pharmacist is being reimbursed. And this is gonna uh, hurt pharmacists to tell, say this, but I said, okay, put my information in your system to see what I'm gonna actually pay, end up paying. I walked out paying 85 cents for that prescription. So my number went from $20 to $18 to 85 cents. You are overpaying even sometimes when you're using your insurance card and everybody should be asking that question. Now, going to the your last question was, what happens for the cash paying patients, right? If we get rid of rebates and everything else, yes, it would benefit patients with insurance, but what about patients who are, don't have insurance, right? 
Lisa? That's what your question was. So I go back last February when the seven CEOs testified in Senate uh, hearing, with Chairman Grassley's hearing. They all agreed that if you get rid of rebates in the marketplace, in both Medicare and commercial side, they committed to lowering their list prices. And this goes back to the Schaefer study that rebates do impact list prices. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Lisa, I appreciate that. So just one more question here. Laura, you had a question? I'm actually okay. Alan addressed the question I had, so nothing further from me. Okay, sounds good. Well, Dr. Pavlovian, thank you again. Appreciate uh, you being here. Thanks for being on the hot seat here for a while, ask, answering all these questions. It's very helpful. Um, really appreciate the information you shared today. Thank you, Nathan. And I really enjoyed the discussion. Hope this helps out. Sounds good. All right, thanks everyone. I know you know we're a little behind our schedule, but um, as I mentioned, with GoodRx not being here today, we do have a little extra time. And uh, as we have in previous uh, meetings, I think it's good for people to have a chance to ask questions and really have the back and forth um, during the presentations. I think there's a lot of value in that. So with that, uh, Peter Felstad, I will turn it over to you and your team. Hi, can you hear me okay, Nate? Yes, I can. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name's Peter Fjallstead, and um, I'm working in the state policy realm for Pfizer, excuse me, not Pfizer, for Pharma. Pfizer's one of our member companies. Um, along with two of my other colleagues today, we'll be presenting from the manufacturer's uh, perspective. There'll be a little bit of overlap with um, what Dr. Popovian said, but there is also gonna be additional and new information that he didn't present as well as a deeper dive on some of the topics um, that the good doctor presented. Um, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, I've got a uh, past in the healthcare world, uh, working at different organizations. And um, just let me uh, have Samo Pandya, my colleague from Pharma, introduce himself briefly. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Samo Pandya. I'm, I'm in the Alliance Department at Pharma. I've been at Pharma for about five years. Um, working for over 17 years before coming to pharma, I worked on the business side. Nine years working in insurance companies at Cigna, Coventry Healthcare, and of Delaware, and uh, Evergreen Health Co-op, which was the co-op in Maryland, was funded through the Affordable Care Act, uh, working in finance and medical economics roles. And I also used to price medicines for a living at AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals for over five years and worked as a global market access consultant. So I hope you find what we have to present uh, informative. I'll turn it over to Sharon, I guess. Thanks, Samal. I appreciate everybody's attention and I want to thank you, Nate, for inviting us. Um, we are working in, uh, closely with your task force member, Peter Photos, and we appreciate the time today to talk to you about some really important issues and hopefully leverage a lot of what Dr. Popovian just spoke about. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and so we just want to briefly um, start our presentation. Uh, next slide, please with an intro video with a mention of, uh, we know governor, the governor had had a previous battle against esophageal cancer, which required surgery, um, I think it's uh, 12 years ago now. Um, our video here shows our industry's response in fighting uh, pediatric forms of cancer um, and the, bio the biopharmaceutical companies um, really on the front lines against, um, against cancer. And so um, please uh, press play on the video. It looks like we're having some problems with the audio on the video. Hmm. Peter, do you want to maybe continue with your presentation? I apologize. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is here, but we could try to work it out on our end and let you know when we get it figured out. Sure. Sounds good, Nate. Yeah, it was, it was just a mother talking about um, her child's um, battle and ultimately successful battle uh, against pediatric cancer. So I'll turn it over to... Uh, my colleague Sharon, next slide, please. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. 
Um, just a little bit, we're going to cover a lot of information in the next hour, but we want to leave enough time for questions and answers. But we're starting to, um, we want to address a lot of misconceptions and inaccuracies about the industry and really talk about some of the important facts that I believe this task force needs to make the needed recommendations that, Dr., uh, that uh, Governor Evers had encouraged everybody to do. You guys are fantastic. Um, the composition of this task force is, is just astounding. And if there's anything we can do after this presentation for more follow-up, please let it, our colleague Peter Photos know and we will get you more information. But just to give you a little bit about pharma, I know you all may realize this, but just quick 30,000 foot, we have 35 member companies throughout the country that make brand name medicines. So these are not generic medicines, they're brand name innovative medicines. And there are cures and treatments that are needed by patients. And I'm so proud as a nurse by training and someone who worked at National Institutes of Health for a good part, part of my career to be now working over 18 years at pharma in the industry, um, working on these un important medicines. And it, most importantly, how do we get access to patients and healthcare providers that need it? This slide shows an interesting stat that there are, and this delivers probably one of the best hopeful messages for patients, is that 4,500 medicines are currently in development in the United States. And we broke it down by disease states. You'll see 1,120 are cancer medicines that are in development. Really important now is um, today, we had in fact a report that was released that said 400 medicines are in development for infectious disease. And that's very important because that includes COVID related treatments and vaccines that I'll get to later in the presentation. But 200 or more for heart disease and stroke. Um, we have 566 for rare diseases. So we are truly in a new era where breakthrough medicines and innovation is happening. Previously, medicines were made from compounds. Previously, medicines were targeted to the diseases. And now we see treatments are made from living cells. They're personalized to treat the patient for their exact genetic makeup. We have things that were previously touched on like CRISPR, and we have CAR-T therapy for cancer and really innovative medications that are, are um, helping patients fight their disease very specifically. The next slide talks about how many of these are potential first-in-class medicines. Now, what does that mean? A lot of people say, Sharon, what is that first-in-class? First-in-class, I know our pharmacy folks on the line know a lot about this in our physicians, but this means the very first medicine to treat a condition or a disease. So this offers a lot of help that says 74% of the drugs in the pipeline have the potential to be first in class. And the next slide, perhaps even more exciting for me, is that 42% of those medicines have the potential to be personalized. That means a patient does not have to fail first. They don't have to try one to two cancer medicines or asthma medications to get it right. They get it right on the first time. That's less cost, that's better quality of life, that's better health outcomes, it benefits everyone. So to have that personalized medicine, which does involve more research and development and does involve more resources is well worth it. And it's great to see that a good number, almost half of those medicines in the pipeline could be personalized. The next slide talks a little bit about cancer. Again, an important piece. Um, I'm sorry, I thought it was cancer, but we will go on to the next one. This slide talks about um, how many medicines are being transformed in the treatment of disease. For the first time ever, we have a hepatitis cure. This is in 12 weeks, what normally was a long debilitating, um, horrible condition that would usually involve in an expensive liver transplant at the end. We now have a cure for over 93% of hepatitis cases. So we also have MS, the first oral medicine available. I'm a neuro nurse by training to see that you don't have to have IVs and expensive and long infusions for MS that you traditionally needed, that you have an oral pill available. That's incredible progress. And of course, rheumatoid arthritis with new DMARDs and other medicines that are treating disfigured joints, allowing people to return back to work and actually reforming their joints back to almost normal. The next slide 
talks about the decline in cancer rates. And this is exciting because back in um, 1990, we were seeing astronomical death rates. Now we see a 27% decline in cancer death rates since 1990. People that are diagnosed have a five-year survival rate or more that has been increased by 41%. And a lot of this is due to early detection and treatment, but a majority is because of our new treatments and, and the things that we have, the innovative medicines to treat cancer. The next slide talks about an important condition near and dear to my heart is Alzheimer's because of my neuro background at NIH. I worked extensively on Alzheimer's protocols, and this is a public health emergency that is literally looming. By 2050, if we do not have a treatment or a medicine that will reduce or slow the progress of Alzheimer's or hopefully cure it, we are gonna see costs as expensive as $765 billion, and that's 2050. Now, if we saw a treatment that could delay the onset, you would see costs drop to 547, but if we could have a cure or we could have some sort of treatment, it, the study shows the development of a new treatment that delays the onset of Alzheimer's could save Medicaid $218 billion by 2050. Again, this is something that a lot of us are facing currently with family members and long-term care costs are astronomical. And Salmo, my, my colleague will talk about that in the costs here in Wisconsin um, in a moment. The next slide talks about rare diseases. And this is important because a lot of people say, Sharon, you know, you, you, your industry only goes after the big things like the cancers. We have 8,000 rare diseases today and many of them are life-threatening, like 90%. And people say, why is your industry not doing more? I'm happy to say we are. Actually, we have over, um, we know that 30 million Americans have a rare disease and only 5% have a treatment approved for it. So we do have a, a long way to go. But when the Orphan Drug Act was passed back in 1983, which incentivized industry to work on rare diseases, even though it might be a smaller patient population, um, we were happy to see that we saw 770 approvals and that was just um, there were only 10 approvals right before that act passed. So just a piece to, to touch on rare diseases, because well, that's it. It's a big piece and, and uh, a big debate that we have that we wanted to address, and we can talk further about that. But the next slide talks about an important example of just four. One of them on the top left-hand corner, Fabry's disease, is something I personally worked on that clinical trial at NIH with young men who are impacted with this genetic disorder that causes fatty buildup in all of your organs. And it's extremely painful and debilitating and hereditary. And often they don't know they have it until they're into their childbearing years. So this is a disease that continued as you can imagine, but I was so happy to see that a treatment was first approved in 2018 and I was part of those clinical trials. So it's nice to see that medicines are transforming many rare diseases. The next slide is probably one of our most important slides and a fun, fun, fundamental piece for people to understand that research and development, I wish we were making ice cream, we are not. It is risky, it is expensive. It takes 10 to 12 years to bring a drug from bench to bedside, that's 10 to 12 years. We have 88% that unfortunately fail, only 12% make it. And you know, many of them do make it, and we are able to recoup a lot of our research and development costs, but many don't, and we need to recoup for those failures. You'll see on Alzheimer's disease, what we just touched on, 123 unsuccessful attempts, yet four of those resulted in delaying some of the symptoms and the progression in the onset. 96 for melanoma, seven were actually successful, and 167 for lung cancer, 10 being successful. All this to say it's about $2.6 billion to bring a drug to market. Why is this so important? It's just important because when you think of any other sector in business, I don't know about you, but if I was a businesswoman, and I was looking at investing and the endeavors were an 88% failure rate and only 12% success, that's so risky. 
So we have to maintain a good policy environment. The things you're very well recommending at this task force is, it is so important because you don't want it to have a negative impact on research and innovation for patients of Wisconsin and throughout the country because it can have an unintended detrimental effect if you don't understand this slide. And I know that you all do, but I just want to make a moment to, to emphasize, especially as we're in a pandemic and we're looking for a treatment and a cure and a vaccination for COVID, this is extremely expensive. And so it's just a consideration to know, I wish it, it was easier, I wish it was cheaper, but those are the facts. The next slide shows that Despite the challenges of risk and development um, of development, we have invested almost $80 billion in 2019 for research and development. And the next slide talks about the important clinical trial phases. And we know that there are three phases. A lot of people say, yes, yeah, Sharon, I know there's like, you said it's 10 to 12 years and you know there's three uh, uh, clinical trials, however, there's also a clinical trial that continues post-approval that's called phase four there in the lavender or the purple on the far right. So we are very careful to make sure that it goes through the appropriate FDA rigors, that we have the safety and efficacy of a drug before we put it in a human body and we expect it to work. Again, super important slide. I'll touch on it in a moment on how it relates to COVID because a lot of people say, can we just speed that up? We're in the middle of a pandemic and we need to get through these clinical trials a little faster than 12 years, um, understood, but also the safety is very important of it and how we conduct those clinical trials can't be changed. So I will talk to you more about that in a moment, but first I'd like to talk about Wisconsin's clinical trials with Peter. Peter? Hi, thanks Sharon. So um, as Sharon mentioned, a big uh, part of the R&D process um, has to do with clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. And um, in Wisconsin, right now, in the, most late, in the latest data that we have, there have been uh, ongoing 409 clinical trials with around 6,800 participants, a uh, little over $90 million invested, and, uh, we gener and we generate with these clinical trials about $237 million in economic impact to the state's uh, economy. Um, and so our industry, we believe, brings profound value to patients through new treatments and cures for society's most devastating and costly diseases and conditions, and we provide millions of them, um, including the 6,800 participants in our clinical trials in Wisconsin, um, the treatments they otherwise might not have. So since 2000, our member companies have invested over $800 billion in our R&D, um, in the R&D of new treatments of cures, including um, just an estimate of a little over $71 billion, and that's in 2017 alone. Um, developing new medicines is a complex process, and as Sharon mentioned, it takes on average uh, more than 10 years, between 12 and 15 years sometimes. Um, less than 12% of those candidate medicines, as mentioned, make it to clinical trials will actually be approved by the FDA. And um, it's really these clinical trials that take place in Wisconsin and other states are the most time and resource intensive part of the R&D process um, for a new medicine. And um, our industry manufactures the support and conducts the majority of this important work. Um, without the clinical trials, new medicines could not be approved. And most importantly, they wouldn't be uh, made available to the patients who really need them for their health and well-being. Next slide, please. So you can just look, here's the uh, little pharmaceutical life cycle. Um, there's a lot of phases that go on between um, the research and development process, including clinical trials, before um, a medicine ultimately gets to be um, on, sold over the counter um, with or without a prescription to a patient. So only five in 5,000 compounds that enter preclinical testing make it to human testing. Okay, I'm starting really early on in this process. And only, uh, of, only of these five people, excuse me, only of these five tested in people is approved. So um, just to break down what you've got here in the life cycle, um, first we have the discovery or preclinical testing, which on average takes about six and a half years. Um, following that, we have phase one, which takes about a year and a half. Then we have 
phase two, which is about two more years. And the last phase prior to FDA submission takes around three and a half years. So that's a long time when finally the drug goes through the review and approval process at the FDA for another year and a half. Um, phase four follows that approval if it's approved, the medicine, and then there's an additional post-marketing testing required by the FDA. Um, and so this process is an extremely long period of time. Next slide, please. Here's a little bit more uh, talking about um, the industry doing the majority of the research to translate basic science into new medicines. Um, as you can see, the 2017 industry R&D investment I mentioned previously. Um, it's just a good graph to look at. Next slide, please. So, so thank you, Peter. This one is interesting because medications, when you look at the entire healthcare system, I don't know of any other sector that over time that the elements go down over time. And what Peter had just mentioned, as you evolve from brand medicines to generic, you will see competition enter. There will be a competitor that comes in within one to two years of launch of a brand new first-in-class medicine. Let's take hep C. Hep C, back in 2014, you remember Savaldi, Gilead's drug, revolutionary, first ever cure for hepatitis. But it was expensive upon initial launch price. However, within a few years, it dropped by 83%. So the, we just talked about list prices, which is like sticker prices. That was 86,000 to about 32,000 once negotiated benefit uh, discounts and negotiations were taking place. If you look at type two diabetes and looking at some of the classes of medicines that dropped 36% in the next in the next couple of years. Just a really important illustrative slide to show you that over time competition does help bring down the cost of medicines, and it is important for patients. And we are not someone that says, "Ah, oh, it's going to be generic. Generics don't work." That's not true. We want to see more efficiency in the FDA approval to get generics to market more quickly. We do think generics have an important place, but it's up to the healthcare provider who knows their patient best, whether or not a brand or a generic might work best. Sometimes the therapeutic in, in indexes are different for cardiovascular diseases or neurological diseases like I focused on, where you do want a brand, but in some instances, generics are great. The next slide talks about the patent clip. A lot of people say, well, gosh, you know, you, you you're going to have it go off patent over time, but how much money is that that you lose or you need to hopefully have another innovator in the pipeline that will make it? We are going to lose from 2019 to 2023, we will lose $95 billion. This is not a woe is us. I feel sorry for you, Pharma, but it's an important slide to show that this is how many medicines will be going off patent and how this does impact companies like Pfizer, who's one of 35 of our member companies. And that's not the plethora, the whole gamut of pharmaceutical companies. That's our trade association. But that's to show how the competition from generics and biosimilars, which have value, are going to reduce the sales by $95 billion. So that's important to keep in in context for us, just knowing about what we're facing. Peter's gonna talk now about how our profits are in line with other industries and much lower in some cases. Peter. Thanks, Sharon. As patients and uh, Americans all over talk about the uh, healthcare um, spending and how much they spend out of money and the money flowing around the system overall. Next slide, slide please. Um, we just want to illustrate how biopharmaceutical profits are in line with those of other industries. If you look at the graph on this slide, um, the average economic profit for selected industries, you see that biopharmaceutical is near the bottom of the selected industries that we put on this graph. And, uh, you know, if you were able to add other industries, it would still be somewhere near the bottom compared with a lot of those uh, further up such as advertising, healthcare support services, and then you go down, down, down. Um, next slide, please. The company marketing, and I know that there was a question earlier for Dr. Popovian about advertising or marketing, um, usually talking about um, those that are on television. So the use of inflated estimates 
of, of marketing and promotion spending has created the false impression that the, our industry spends more on marketing than R&D, which is just not true. Uh, more precise estimates show the opposite to be true. You see at this graph, select industry expenses for 2016, our latest data available. Um, you see the R&D figure is well over $90 billion, where the marketing and promotion is um, less than a third of that. And so what that marketing and promotion includes is advertising to consumers, which the previous panelist was asking a question about, advertising to healthcare professionals, obviously doctors, um, sales reps, but it excludes freight costs and other um, general expenses. Um, Peter, if I could add to that, it's important because a lot of folks say, well, how much of that 28.1% is DTC, which is direct to consumer advertising? It's about six billion of that 28. And when Peter said that that 28.1 includes GNA expenses, which is general and administrative expenses, that's keeping the lights on. That's the building facilities, which often one facility needs to be built for one medication. It might need to be torn down where there's a new medication that is to be made because of, of, of requirements. It's very expensive to just do that. A lot of things are, are lumped into that marketing and promotion, but you're looking at only $6 billion when you're looking at DTC. And we're going to talk a little bit more about DTC in a moment. Thank you, Peter, for letting me interject. Sure. Thanks, Sharon. And I'll get to that GNA in just a couple of slides a little bit more when I talk about the facilities um, that our industry has in Wisconsin. So next slide, please. Um, just unlike any other industry in the United States, our industry reinvests mo the most. Um, our member companies take their revenues and invest it into tomorrow's treatments and cures. Um, obviously, you remember I was talking a few slides ago about the lengthy process from uh, the genesis of an idea throughout the R&D process, the clinical trials, and the lengthy time period until FDA approval and ultimately uh, allow it, the allowance of a drug to be sold to consumers. In 2018, we said again, just to reiterate, $90 billion spent on R&D in 2018 alone. 20% of that is reinvested, uh, much more than the, in the software industry, which is about 11% reinvestment, automotive industry, which is about 6% reinvestment, and more. So we're generally, over time, kept that number pretty consistent or even increased it. That's the reinvestment in the R&D process. So next slide, please. Um, our industry has a pretty diverse manufacturing supply chain and we've got a very significant presence in the United States. Um, this topic's been a big discussion the last couple of years. We've got over 1300 facilities in the United States, um, including uh, you know, production of medicines located in about 45 states and Puerto Rico, um, which is compared to fewer than 150 um, facilities for just generics. Again, that's, that's 1,300 for the brand name companies that we represent versus about 150 for the generic manufacturing facilities, uh, most of which are abroad. Um, we directly employ about 120,000 employees at specifically specific manufacturing facilities and about uh, 11, well, a little over 800,000 Americans in total, supporting about 4 million jobs across the economy. Specifically in Wisconsin, we've got three uh, companies with major presence, three member companies. EMD Serono has got a Madison manufacturing facility, a Milwaukee manufacturing facility, also with administration that Sharon mentioned previously, the GNA. Um, it's got distribution and they've got an R&D presence. They've also got a manufacturing facility in Sheboygan Falls and another one in Verona. Johnson & Johnson has an R&D um, operation in Madison, and Pfizer has a manufacturing facility in Middleton. Those are all important to the economic impact that provide jobs um, for Wisconsinites. Um, next slide, please. A little bit more on the economic impact from the uh, pharmaceutical industry on Wisconsin. There's about $12 billion in total goods and services supported by the pharmaceuticals, biopharmaceutical sector. You can see the um, employee productivity figures around 473,000 per employee in direct biopharmaceutical sector jobs versus 172,000 or so per employee across all jobs in Wisconsin. 
That revenue is generated just under $700 million in total state and federal taxes paid, which um, as you know, goes to a lot of it goes to the Wisconsin state budget. Um, average compensation for an employee in a direct biopharmaceutical sector job, that's direct, not indirect, is around $89,000 and that's versus a little under $54,000 for um, average jobs across the state of Wisconsin. So just to break down real quick on those um, Wisconsin jobs in the biopharmaceutical sector, the greatest is, in, is about 17% of those jobs uh, are in the life, physical, and social science. Obviously, um, for the last five, 10 years, a big focus has been on STEM sector jobs in order to be uh, internationally competitive with other countries. Um, and 16% of those jobs are in production or the manufacturing um, categorized, 12% in the office and administrative support. Again, back to that GNA figure that Sharon talked about, 12% in management, and then you just, you get down, down, and down. And there's all sorts of people that are indirectly affected by uh, the industry's um, large presence in the state of Wisconsin. Um, next slide, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Samo for um, his part. Thanks, Peter. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about now are maybe a little bit of an overlap with what Dr. Popovian uh, presented, but I think we can add some additional nuance to that discussion. So what you see here is there's been a lot of talk about out of control spending on pharmaceutical on prescription medicines. But what you see here are from 2015 to 2018, what the growth rates in, in drug spending have been from CVS Health, Express Scripts, and then from the federal government, which is the national health expenditures. Down in 2018, you'll see that CVS Health reported that drug spending grew by 3.3%. They have 90 million covered lives. Express Scripts uh, said that their drug spending grew by 0.4%. They have over 80 million covered lives and are also doing now negotiating for, for MedImpact, which makes that number even higher. National Health Expenditures, which is the, done by CMS, which is the, the national inventory of what we spend on healthcare, said that drug spending increased by 3.3%. So as we can see before, but these, the numbers you see here for CVS Health and Express Scripts primarily represent their costs. That does not necessarily represent the cost of what happens downstream. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what, how much do we spend on healthcare and how much do we spend on prescription drugs? Again, the source of this information comes from the national, starts out with the National Health Expenditures Report, which is a report that's put out on an annual basis by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, part of Health and Human Services in the US federal government. This pie chart represents $3.6 trillion of spending. That's what happened in 2018, it's a trillion with a T. Of that three points, so, but what the national, what that is called NHG, National Health Expenditures Report, what they represent for drugs is spending on retail medicines, which are medicines that are dispensed through retail pharmacies. So only the pharmacy benefit. So we say, well, that's not a complete picture because, you know, there's also medicines that are dispensed in nursing homes and hospitals and physician offices. So those expenses originally in the NHG report were in those respective categories. But then the Altarum Institute, which is a very well-respected health economics firm, went in and said, well, how much is that, how much money is spent on prescription medicines in those other settings? So the NHE report said that about 10% of US healthcare spending is on prescription drugs. Altarum found that an additional 4% is on non-retail non, non uh, that are, is on uh, non -retail drugs, uh, which is like drugs that are dispensed in hospitals and, and physician offices. That's how you get to the 14% number that you see there in the light blue on the right-hand side. So we're saying that 14% of U.S. healthcare expenditures are on prescription medicines. No other medicine spending is not included in any other category on this particular pie chart. It's been removed and consolidated within that 14% slice. But what's in that 14%? And the way that this numbers, these numbers are reported is three buckets that are included in that number. It's how much that is, has been retained by brand companies, how much is being retained by generic companies, and how much is being retained by the pharmaceutical supply chain, which is a system of wholesalers, pharmacies, PBMs, et cetera, within the system where, where you distribute medicines. So how much those entities retain in this call, this is basically uh, net revenue, not net profits, but net revenue for all those entities is what is contained in that number, is, is what is reported as prescription drug spending. Now, Sharon talked briefly about 
how much um, our company spent on research and development. Those R and D expenses are still in that seven in the number that you see there for brand medicines. So seven percent of total U.S. healthcare spending is on brand medicines, or is retained by brand companies. Three percent by generic, and four percent by the supply chain. But within that seven percent number for brand manufacturers includes the R and D expenditures. They haven't been removed yet. So these are not profit numbers. But all the discussion has been about brand utilization costs. So we're really talking about 7% of the overall pie. Next slide, next slide please. So in Wisconsin, for the, with regard to their Medicaid spending, Wisconsin's Medicaid spending uh, pie chart looks like this, where only 3.5% of what Wisconsin spent on Medicaid in 2018 went to brand drugs, net of rebates and discounts. An additional 2.1% were for generic medicines. It's a very relatively small piece of that pie. Now again, this is net of rebates and discounts. And the latest data that I have show that in 2007, the last data that I have on rebates paid to Wisconsin was from 2017, show that $714 million were paid in rebates and discounts back to Wisconsin and to the federal government. So it was paid back to the state and then the state shared it back with the federal government based on your FMAP percentage that you have with, with the federal government. So it's a relatively small piece of this overall pie as well. Can you please move on to the next slide, please? And where has it been? What has the trend been so far? So this, the chart here that you see, the green line is talks about prescription drug spending growth. Again, the, the source for this is the National Health Expenditures Report, US federal government. And that blue line represents the total healthcare spending growth rate. And what we see in 2013 into 14, there was a spike in the amount of spending done on prescription medicines. That was the year that the Hep C cures came out to the market before the rebate started kicking in. Um, it's also, that was also a record year for FDA approvals of new medicines. Since then, look what's happened. Since 2000, mid 2000, between 2015 and 16 and now, prescription drug spending growth rates have been below that of overall total healthcare spending growth rate. And they're projected to remain so going out um, across a, approximately over the next decade. Can you move to the next um, slide, please? So we talked a little bit about, Dr. Povian also talked a little bit about, you know, the difference between list price growth trend and net price trend. This, the source of this slide is from IQVIA, which is uh, by the largest data aggregation consulting firm in the United States. The top line represents what they call invoice price trend, which is the equivalent of list price trend. And the bottom line represents net price trend. This is brand prices. So as you see in 2018, net prices, brand, net, net prices for brand drugs grew by 0.3%. So the difference between these two lines are rebates, discounts, and other price concessions that manufacturers give to the overall supply chain. They're not trivial amounts of money. In 2018, that total amount, amount, the total amount of uh, price concessions amounted to $166 billion. In 2019, it grew to $175 billion. The reason why manufacturers give these price concessions is, it, is in exchange for formulary access on the formularies of these large PBMs. The top three PBMs control about 75, 74, 75% of the overall market. And if you have a PBM like, uh, like Caremark, which is owned by CBS Health, you have like 90 million covered lives and Express Scripts has 80 million covered lives. Not making it onto that formulary can have a substantial business impact for your company. Can we move to the next slide, please? So we were talking a lot about insulin before. This is a, a slide that's from a report called the Follow the Dollar Report that Pharma published in November of 2017. It's been out on our website ever since then. And the slide and the page after this one, at least in the report, shows a detailed breakdown with, with um, well, the formulas on how every number was calculated. So the manufacturer sells to the wholesaler, wholesaler ships to the, sells to the pharmacy, PBM refer, reimburses the pharmacy, health plan reimburses the PBM, manufacturer pays the PBM rebate, which they share with the health plan. Over on the right, this is a $400 insulin product. Over on the right, if the box is in blue, that means the entity retains that amount of money. If it's in green, that means the, that, the, that the person, that the entity or person spends that amount of money. This is an example where the patient is taking insulin and they're in the deductible. And they have not met their deductible. Again, this is from 2017, so these rebate levels are relatively, are a bit dated in that sense, but the entire logic still is, is accurate. 
we show a 65% base rebate here. But in actuality, rebates for insulins are approaching 80% or a little bit higher in some cases now. This shows that the manufacturer of that $400 insulin retained about $88. Wholesale retains, retains about $2. Their, their business model is predicated on a relatively small uh, margin on a very large volume. Pharmacy retains $25.25. The patient paying the full freight of the medicine. The PBM retains $53.75 and the health plan retains $239. So in this scenario, the PBM and the health plan pay nothing. They make money on this prescription. Patients paying the full freight. And this is why we feel that it is so deeply unfair that the system is set up this way that our rebates and discounts are not being shared with patients. This rebate in this example is 65%. But in actuality, like I said, now, nowadays it's more closer to 80%. If 100% of those rebates were passed through to the patient at the point of sale, you would reduce that patient's cost sharing by you know, up to 80% in today's, in today's numbers. But it's not the end of the story. There's been a tremendous amount of not just horizontal, but vertical integration within this overall supply chain. You've got, like I said before, about three PBMs controlling 74 to 75% of the overall PBM market. You've got um, wholesalers, about three wholesalers controlling about 93% of the wholesaler market. And they're also, they're buying one another. I mean, so now you've got um, United Healthcare owns Optum, and then Optum also owns big, you know, all the PBMs own large uh, mail order pharmacies as well as specialty pharmacies. And in many cases, in that situation, you've also got to where, um, you know, that they own the pharmacies. You have uh, C uh, Express Scripts and Cigna as part of the same parent company. And again, Express Scripts has their own uh, retail and specialty pharmacies. And um, this uh, part of Aetna, uh, CVS has purchased Aetna, which then owns, so CVS has their own retail pharmacies, specialty pharmacies, and they hold about 10,000 uh, retail pharmacy stores. So many of these entities are all rolled into one. So when you're talking about how much the pharmacy retains, the PBM retains, and how much the health plan retains, in many cases, that's the same parent company. You're just taking money out of their left pocket and putting it into the person's right pocket in that sense. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And this is the slide that Dr. Popovian also showed, but this shows what the trend has been. So in every case, that you would see, actually, can I do one thing? Can we move back to the, to the last slide? I forgot one point here. Can we go back to the last slide for a second? One more thing, one more point I wanted to make for you guys is that every, how every entity in the system makes their money is a percentage of the list price of the medicine. So as the list price of a medicine increases, every entity in this system makes more money. So if a manufacturer is dealing with a situation where they would like to lower a list price, potentially, um, say they want to leave the net price the same, but they would like to have a lower net price. And that means the wholesaler, the pharmacy, the PBM, all make less in that overall system. And, we're all, and the reason why they pay these rebates and discounts, because the gap between the list and the net price, is that because they want to be able to get the best formulary access. Now, if they, if they were to lower the list price in the medicine, that's how much the patient's cost sharing is predicated off of. You would have a situation where, and if you had competing products, say you had two or three products which are basically interchangeable, is that the product that lowered their list price, thereby making everyone else in the supply chain make less money, is that product still going to have the same formulary access as their competitors? Probably not. They're not going to say, yes, it's okay, you're a good guy, we'll leave the net the same, you can lower the list, we'll all make less money, and that'll be fine. It typically won't. That product will oftentimes will have a very difficult time continuing to remain on formulary, which is a big problem in this overall system and leads to many of the misaligned incentives that Dr. Popovian talked about. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Again, this is the thing we talked about before, that where the trend has been, and currently in 2018, manufacturer, the manufacturers retain about 54% of total, what is totally spent on prescription drugs. The supply chain retains the rest. But look what the trend has been. In 2013, manufacturers retained about 66%, the supply chain about 33%. And that gap, that gap is narrowed. It doesn't take a genius to see that in the coming years, it's very possible that those two lines will intersect, whereby the supply chain will retain a majority of what is spent on prescription medicines. Can we go to the next slide? 
Again, it's the same thing we talked about before. Now, the 54% of what, um, what is being retained by the menu on the left-hand side by manufacturers, 46 by the supply chain. And we see what these rebates and amounts have been. I told you that the, the, the rebates grew, rebates, discounts, and other price concessions in the system were about 74 billion in 2012. They're at over um, 175 billion by 2019. They're not a trivial amount of money. But, but keep in mind, this is, a, this is a very sizable share of prescription drug spending. But the prescription drug spending is a relatively modest share of overall healthcare spending, which is what we're gonna to get to in a moment. Can we go to the next slide, please? That's when we talk about the premium impact. And people keep talking about, like I worked for, I worked in my life for nine years in health plans. I worked for three health plan CFOs. So we did all the financial statements when we collected pharmaceutical rebates and how we booked those revenues and how much we got from the manufacturer, pharmaceutical manufacturers, how we booked that, booked that particular income. This is a study that was done by Milliman over two years ago. So this study showed that, that even in the, in the maximum case with the, where coinsurance was applied, full pass-through rebates increased, uh, results in a change to the plan's cost, of, a change in premiums of about 1%. It's not totally out of line with what uh, Dr. Pavoyan presented with regard to what, happened, what the actual real data is from California, which showed about a 1.5% increase. So this was a projection, it was an actuarial projection based by Milliman, which is a very you know, well-respected actuarial firm, but it wasn't far off. It still showed that you had a situation where, um, where uh, that passing through rebates at the point of sale for patients results in a very minimal um, premium impact. Again, those rebates are a sizable portion of prescription drug spending, but prescription drug spending is a small portion of overall healthcare spending. Brand medicines account for 7% of total U.S. healthcare spending, all right? 3% accounted for by generics and 4% went to the supply chain. Generics don't typically pay rebates, they have upfront discounts. So these types of discounts that you would, that you would have seen there because that they, that's the reason why they will not have a substantial premium impact is because as a percentage of the overall spend, which is what the premium is based on, is based on the total cost of the health plan, not just the drug cost of the health plan. Um, that, that's why you would, you would not see a dramatic impact. Now, I'll hand it off to my colleagues for the next slide. Hi, thanks, Samuel. Well, this is Peter. Next slide, please. So we're gonna continue a little bit talking more about the out-of-pocket costs, especially for the sickest that can, sickest in our, um, in our country that continue to soar despite a dramatic slowdown in medicine prices and spending. Um, as you can see that the, um, the, the increase for 2018 um, for both uh, 0.3 and 2.5, and those are the commercial versus the public programs figures of an increase um, in the uh, medicine prices and spending. So you can see that the actual costs are relatively minimal, although the out-of-pocket costs for um, consumers, especially the sickest, continue to soar. Uh, a, a site that many of us in the healthcare world look at um, for regular updates, the Kaiser Family Foundation has shown that out-of-pocket costs for patients, especially those with an employer-sponsored health insurance, rose faster than the costs paid by their insurers uh, for the 10 year period of 2006 to 2016. And that according to our figures is also held steady over the last three years of the data that we have. Um, so over that decade of 2006 to 16, the total amount patients spent on out-of-pocket um, costs grew on average from about $525 to $806, which is a 54% excuse me, that increase of 54% is higher than the increase in payments from health insurers, which rose 48% over that period. So on average over the same time period from uh, $3,100 to about 4,700. In addition, over that 10 year period, the average patient payments toward deductibles, um, also a constant complaint of employers and employees in employer sponsored health insurance rose from 151 dollars to 417, which is an increase of 176% over the period. Um, the average patient payments towards their coinsurance, uh, which is percentage of costs that you 
most of you know, the patient pays is responsible for, for paying out of the pocket rose from $149 to $249, which is over the 10 year period, an increase of 67%. The average patient payments toward their co-pays, which is their fixed costs, um, detailed usually in their policies, as most of you know, decreased 38% from $225 to $140. So when somebody looks at their, um, their policy, obviously they see those co-pays, those fixed costs, but they might not understand exactly what's going on with the deductibles or the co-insurance. I know Dr. Popovian mentioned that earlier in his presentation. Next slide, please. We talk a lot about, um, we have talked a lot about insurers and PBMs, oftentimes who are vertically integrated with each other. As my colleague uh, Samuel mentioned, they have a lot of leverage to hold medicine costs down. And the negotiating power is in increasingly concentrated among fewer pharmacy benefit managers. Um, you can see here's a pie chart mentioning the PBMs that uh, Samuel mentioned previously. You've got OptumRx, owned by United Health Group, CVS Health, which is Caremark and or Aetna combined and Express Scripts, which is, uh, which is recently merged with Cigna. You also have other organizations uh, around the country that have similar market presence or are vertically integrated. I know in Minnesota, where I'm from, uh, Prime Therapeutics is owned by, I believe it's 16 or 17 different Blue Cross plans. And those types of relationships lead to serious um, leverage in order to hold down costs and negotiating power. The insurers also determine a formulary, which is many of you know whether or not a medicine is covered. They determine the tier placement, which is the patient cost sharing amount. Uh, oftentimes an employer will offer one, two, or sometimes even three tier options, depending on how much the patient wants to pay um, out of pocket versus how much an employer might cover for a plan throughout the year. And um, let's see, they also determine their accessibility, which is the utilization management through prior, authoriz prior authorization, or as many of you know it as PA. There's provider incentives that the uh, PBMs and insurers are able to determine. Um, the preferred treatment guidelines and pathways, oftentimes determined by a provider relations department or a medical policy team within a health plan or insurer. Next slide, please, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Sharon. Thank you. and, and uh... Just to, if we could go back to that slide just for a minute, what that Peter had focused on. That the right side shows, as Peter said, and he's he, formerly with Blue Cross Blue Shield, those are, are things that insurers have used and done for years. The formulary, tier placement, accessibility, provider incentives, those are things that farm is not opposed to, but what we would like to see is an open access to formulary and as little hurdles and hoops that patients and providers need to go through to get the right medicines they need. The next slide does show that 90%, and this is actually relevant to Wisconsin, nine out of 10 prescriptions in the US or 90%, it's actually 91 in Wisconsin, but 91% of all medicines filled in the state are generic. So when you go to the pharmacy counter and you get it filled, 91% are being filled with generic. It's just to show you it's interesting and um, generics have allowed $1.9 trillion in savings over the past decades. And again, not opposed to generics, but it's important to put that into context as we talk about prescription drug prices. The next slide talks about the brand. This is really important because we all know we all have our own personal health care insurance plans. We have formularies. But when you look at the trend over time of how formularies are excluding drugs, it's a concern. We have about 56 new medicines that were approved last year. So more and more prescription medicines being approved, but more and more being excluded from private insurance formularies and state plans. And so this is an important piece because you, this actually looked at, this was a Tufts Institute study that looked at access to formularies and it showed that, um, that, it, that Express Scripts excluded 242 medicines in 2019 and CBS excluded 173. You might say, what is that 242 out of? Well, it was looking at all the medicines that were approved. It was actually looking at um, 
you know, the, uh, how, how many medicines were approved and of those, how many were excluded. And, and our position, again, is just making sure that those, those therapies are available for patients. Um, you know, if you need to do step therapy, if there are, are uh, utilization management techniques to put on there, do it. But excluding it from the formulary is to the detriment of patients who need a variety of medicines. I'm an identical twin. Um, my twin is in Texas. I'm here in D.C., but we both have, for example, gastric reflux. That's something that you'd think with identical makeup, we would be able to take the same drug. We, we don't. We need, one size does not fit all. And so you need as many tools in the toolbox. And this type of restriction on formularies is really not acceptable. The next slide is talking a little bit about a frequent ac um, accusation that we get. Like, why is it that patients are spending, you know, the, the, what it, what's happening with the out-of-pocket costs? And unfortunately, patients are feeling it at the pharmacy counter. Something Dr. Popovian and Sommel have talked about is, what happens if we share some of that $166 billion rebates to the patient at the point of sale at the pharmacy counter? Um, that would be a very important solution we'll talk about in a moment. But when you look at what's happening right now, we're seeing 52% of plans that have had drugs deductibles. That's a drug deductible, meaning the patient has to pay a deductible before they can get access to their medicines. That's something unusual and different. Usually it's, you see, whoops, I think somebody got off mute. That's okay. Um, but anyway, so it's usually you'd see that um, with a going to the doctor, going to the hospital, but to see a drug only deductible that 52% of plans have that, that's, that's, a, that's a, an important access issue for patients. Secondly, the increased use of tiering. It used to be we had basically tier one, tier two, tier three. Now we're seeing more and more tiering for prices of medicines that 51% of plans now have four or more tiers. The next slide talks about how patients are facing high costs and what does it do for treatment. So if you look at that next slide in green, there you go. It is actually interesting because it's showing that patients are facing higher, that fit pay, fit patients that face higher cost sharing are slower in getting access to treatments. This looked at CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, a type of cancer, and it showed that patients were twice as slow in getting treatment initiated if they had high out-of-pocket costs. It also shows that, um, that they tend not to take their medicines. Uh, this is, has all sorts of ramifications, and for cancer patients, not good. The next patient talks about solutions. A lot of you might say, okay, Sharon, Peter, Sommel, you've talked a lot about the issues. Give us some sort of solution. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see the four solutions that we'd like to share with you. And we have one pagers on all of them, but that's what this task force is, is charged with. And you guys have an insurmountable type of task. I mean, it's looking at the cost of healthcare, but again, I'm challenging you and I'm hoping our colleagues today have been able to challenge you not to focus myopically on only pharmaceuticals because it's a small part of the bigger picture. But if you are looking at pharmaceuticals, what are some of the things you can do with all the multiple diverse stakeholders we have, not only with this task force, but within the supply chain that we operate, the reality of today? We may not be able to change just us, <laughs> the, the way rebates work, even though we'd like to, but what can we do? Or what could we recommend to Nathan, to Governor Evers and others that are looking at real solutions that Wisconsin can be leaders in for the nation because it's not just the state looking at it. First one is sharing the savings and it's really elaborating on what Dr. Popovian said, which is passing on the savings, taking a portion of that rebate. Sommel referenced a study. We are happy to get it to you. It's the Milliman study that showed Indeed, if you take a portion of that $166 billion in rebates that our manufacturers give to the state and to the federal government, just a portion of that went to the patient at the point of sale. It could reduce costs by as much as $800 a year for that patient and only increase premiums by 1%. 
that's a common thing where people say, well, wait, this is, it'll increase premiums way more than that. This is a Milliman, not a pharma study that shows that it can be done. And it's just a, an important way and a different way of looking at things. The second one, Peter is gonna talk a little bit more about, which is making coupon count, but that's something that's been done in four states, four states. We still have 46 more to go, but in four states, the state legislatures have passed what they call accumulator adjustment program bans, which means that if manufacturers provide patients assistance to afford their medicines, that assistance should count to the patient's out-of-pocket deductible. These accumulator programs are often used by plans will not allow that. So four states have said, wait, that's not quite fair. If whoever it comes from, manufacturers, religious, charitable contributions, whatever, it should go to the patient's out-of-pocket costs. So that's something proactive that Wisconsin could do and could be recommended by this committee. The third option on the bottom left shows you offering lower cost sharing options. And what does that mean? It means having plans that are available that have lower cost sharing, lower deductibles, lower co-pays, and as we addressed earlier, the fourth, covering medicines from day one, having maybe not all plans, but some of the plans that do not have drug only the drug deductibles and that a patient could get their medicine that they need from that day one without having to pay a large surprise copay. The next slide I'm going to hand over to Peter and we're going to drill down a little bit more into coupons. Peter. I think you're on mute, Peter. Sorry. Thank you. I wanted to make sure to turn on my video and then the second step was to turn on my my voice. So thank you, Sharon. Um, so the next slide is without coupons, patients would face a higher average out-of-pocket cost per prescription. You can see on here that each January when a plan year begins, since the ACA, all plans have been required to begin uh, on January 1st um, in the commercial market, so in the fully insured market. So each January patients in the commercial market with deductibles, um, they face steep increases in out-of-pocket costs for their brand drugs. You can look for 2014, 2015, and 2016, that that January date has gone up and up and up each year. And those patients, when they have to refill, they're gonna be out of money um, a lot of times right after the holidays when they have to make that prescription refill on that new calendar year policy. And so that's been a big problem, um, especially if they have high copays according to their policy. Next slide, please. Uh, the manufacturer cost sharing assistance or uh, sometimes known as a patient assistance program can help ease a patient's out-of-pocket costs. So for example, in 2017, just 0.4% of a commercial claims were filed with a coupon for a brand medicine that had a generic equivalent. That's an important distinction that I think we've made today throughout our slide deck is the brand medicine versus the generic distinction. And programs that do not count towards manufacturer cost sharing assistance excuse me, programs that do not count manufacturer cost sharing assistance toward a patient's deductible that Sharon just mentioned, um, or out-of-pocket maximum hurt the sickest patients, chronically sick, sickest patients, leaving them without vulnerable to unexpected out-of-pocket costs as high as several thousands of dollars to continue taking their medicine. And obviously, just like people that put off um, uh, surgeries, elective especially, until the end of a calendar year of their health policy. The same, unfortunately, can be said as in the previous slide for uh, medications. Next slide, please. And Sharon mentioned these accumulator adjustment programs, what we call AAP bans. So the four states that she mentioned had proactively passed legislation to make sure that these adjustment programs cannot be um, effective in a fully insured um, policy in the states um, that's, that's able to be sold in the state. First of all, the manufacturing cost sharing assistance that I keep mentioning, it's used by patients enrolled in commercial plans to help them pay their out-of-pocket medicine costs. And this assistance can help them afford these prescribed medicines and stay adherent to them. That includes any medications. Accumulator adjustment programs are used by insurers to exclude the value 
of cost sharing assistance programs from patient cost sharing requirements, again, including deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums, which are ever increasing for those people in the employer-based markets. This excludes the assistance that can lead to patients abandoning their medications due to large supply costs, which is something that we really uh, oppose because it greatly jeopardizes patient safety. The bans can be passed in states to require state regulated plans, again, fully insured, and issuers to count cost sharing assistance toward patient cost sharing requirements. And those four states that Sharon mentioned and that I am now again mentioning have happened in Arizona, Illinois, Virginia, and West Virginia. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the bans would help patients by requiring the manufacturer cost sharing assistance to count. Now they don't ultimately undermine the ability to control costs on a patient, excuse me, on a health plan, or oftentimes their vertically integrated PBMs part to control the cost of the medication that's ultimately borne by the consumer. But the health plans and the issuers are still able to manage the cost through their UM or utilization management restrictions, such as PA or other tools. And they've got a big a big tool belt full of tools that they can use. Federal government's 2021 Notice of Benefit and Payment Parameters, the NBPP, gives group health plans and health issuance consumers, issuers the flexibility to operate these AAPs, but allows states to pass bans for state regulated insurance markets. This is a proact, this is a policy you're going to be hearing a lot more about, we believe. Um, over the next couple of legislative sessions. Wisconsin, like Minnesota, and the other neighbors will all be going into a budget session in uh, the next calendar year. So it's likely that this will crop up in the surrounding states. HHS at the federal level also suggests that there may be a conflict between manufacturer cost sharing assistance counting towards high deductible health plan enrollees deductibles and IRS health savings account or HSAs. But the IRS has not confirmed the federal agencies, that's the United States Department of Health and Human Services interpretation. And even if that interpretation were correct, the conflict would not impact patients unless they're enrolled in an HSA paired with a high deductible health plan. Both HSAs and high deductible health plans have grown in popularity, especially since the uh, passage of the ACA in 2010. Next slide, please. Value, let me just briefly mention value-based contracts and how they deliver results for patients. We believe they have the intent, the potential to benefit patients and the healthcare system generally by improving patient outcomes, reducing costs, and reducing especially the cost of medicines. So for example, an outcome-based contract that's a, that an outcome-based contracts um, is generally results in a 28% lower patient copayments. Um, and they also could generate more than $12 billion if they reduce uh, the diabetes burden um, by, in the United States by only 5%. Obviously, insulin is the um, drug topic of the last few years that most people are talking about. Next slide, please. These are our value assessment principles. Um, and I'll briefly just touch on each of these uh, bullets. We wanna describe a sound process that's open and transparent with opportunity for input and a strong role for patients and physicians. We wanna support patient care and we do that by considering patient preferences and heterogeneity, uh, appropriately communicating results and avoiding misuse. We want to deliver reliable, relevant information by using rigorous, transparent methods that rely on the full range of evidence and prioritize long-term and broader outcomes. And then just the last two would be value continued scientific and medical process. And finally, take a system-wide perspective. Next, uh, Sharon's going to talk about the impact of chronic disease on Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so looking at where our areas, aside from value-based contracts, which we think should be voluntary, but have a lot of legitimate opportunities for 
pharmaceutical companies and health plans and patients. Um, we also think chronic disease is a real unmet need. We know here in the state of Wisconsin that it's almost everyone has at least one chronic disease. Over half of Wisconsinites have at least one to two chronic diseases. And we know early detection, intervention, and prevention is great, but when you get the right treatment for the right condition at the right time, that's the sweet spot. And we know 90 cents of every healthcare dollar is going to treat chronic disease. So this is a real aspect of healthcare we must focus on. We also look at um, the next slide, which shows a partnership to fight chronic disease slide. And it is a coalition. Thanks, Megan, sorry, one more slide. It's coalitions is talking about chronic disease, looking at Wisconsin, estimating that $768 billion is what is the total projected cost of chronic disease between 2016 and 2030, if something is not done. When you look at the fact that 3.4 million Wisconsinites have one or more chronic disease and that 1.3 million have two or more. That could be like asthma and, and uh, hypertension. Um, that is tremendous and we need to look at what we can do and maybe those value-based outcome uh, contracts can help, as, as Dr. Popovian said, rewarding and basing payment on patient outcomes. If but we, one thing we do know, hands down, adherence will save money. That's something all of us can partner, health plans, pharmacists, physicians, patient groups, manufacturers. We all know that if you took medicines as prescribed, you will save money. $213 billion a year could be saved if patients took the medicines as prescribed. That's like people like my 15-year-old son who thankfully doesn't have asthma, but if he doesn't take preventative medicines, he could end up in the emergency room or he could end up missing school, all miss work. All of that translates into absenteeism from the workplace, healthcare costs, ER, ad admissions to the hospital and so forth. The next slide talks to you a little bit about what I had mentioned, the high cost of, um, uh, high cost sharing does reduce adherence that Basically, um, this is another study by RAND to show that patient costs do go up if you're less adherent to taking medicines. It's not rocket science, I know, but it's an important look and glimpse at what happens when medicine copays are doubled. What is the rate of adherence? And what happens to that rate? How far does it go down by disease states? Look at seizure patients, anticonvulsants, Look at the um, look, look at that. I mean, that's 33 uh, percent. You know, it's it's just pretty. It's a good area where we can focus on. We have some good comprehensive medication management um, programs that we could work on, and that's another piece to the solution. The next slide talks about how it can save money in Medicaid. Just looking at eight billion dollars that could be generated in um, spending because uh, in Medicaid. Um, when patients are not adherent. We know Medicaid public program will benefit. This Robux study shows adherence to medicines leads to fewer hospitalizations for Medicaid patients, and it breaks it out by, um, by disease state, looking at congestive heart failure and mental health and hypertension as the most expensive. We're nearing the end, but I want um, Peter to go through some of the other important pieces. We're gonna hit this pretty quickly so we can go to Q&As, respecting that you guys have been on the webinar for quite a while. Thank you, Megan, for helping us make this so smooth. Um, Peter? Thank you, Sharon. Peter, no, I appreciate that. I was just going to actually say if you could wrap up in the next few minutes, uh, give people a little chance for a Q&A. Yes. And then, uh, we, need, we have one more presenter yet today. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nathan. Next slide, please. I know Dr. Popovian briefly talked about the 340B program in um, the effect that it might have on hospitals or health systems. Um, and it furthered the, the program, while, while, um, while helpful for um, especially low-income patients, it further distorts the supply chain. Um, and while skipping through this, if you have any questions on it, please ask it. Um, I don't want to push too much time on this slide. Next slide, please. Another big issue right now in 2020 and will probably continue to be is the state drug importation legislative activity. You can just see 
different states that have filed bills or taken action on bills um, in 2020, and there's likely gonna be more in 2021 as most states go into their budget years. Next slide, please. The biggest thing we'd like to highlight is, is that these importation programs cannot guarantee consumer safety. Um, and it's really been a lot of, um, generated a lot of headaches for pharmacists in states like Colorado and Maine who have tried to figure out how they're gonna actually comply with the program. Um, next slide, please. We believe that savings will be unlikely, especially those early states that have passed um, importation. Um, there's just the data is not there to show that it's going to support um, state budget, especially as many states are going to start going into the red due to COVID pandemic state budget fallout. We don't believe that there's savings to be found with these reimportations. Next slide, please. The Trump administration has two pathways. One, where they're going to allow uh, the reimportation pr pretty much. Um, straight in reimportation from the states. The second would be manufacturers. A lot of that's gonna, by the Trump administrations, um, is an incentive program to manufacture certain drugs and bring them into the United States, um, which has to do with um, certain issues we've talked about with a diverse slide chain, supply chain. Excuse me, next slide, please, and I'll hand it over to Sharon. And this real quickly is DTC. We've brought it up a few times about $6 billion in spending is on DTC, but what's the value? Two things real quick. One is to patients. DTC, whether it, you know you, you like the ads, you hate the ads, it brings patients into healthcare offices. I worked in the ER just a couple of years ago on the weekends while I was working at Pharma. Patients had asked for medicines, but guess what? It started an important conversation with the healthcare provider. They may not have left with that medicine in hand that they were asking for, but it talked about, it was an opportunity for the healthcare provider, the nurse, the doctor, to talk about their condition, to educate them about what treatments are available, and it involved them in the treatment plan. Finally, physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants who are all prescribers do appreciate DTC. They do not have time to go to conferences and read all the medical literature that you need to read on our information. And, FDA tightly regulates what can be said and what can be imparted by sales reps or literature. So this has value, despite some folks that just hate it, it does have value to both the patient and healthcare provider. The next slide is a frequent criticism, even in my family and a Thanksgiving table can say, wait, why are other patients in other countries paying less than the people in the US? Why are we shouldering the burden of the R&D? This is an important question. Um, this could actually be an hour lecture, I know, but really other countries have different healthcare systems. Single payer is not what the US healthcare system looks like. Whether you like that or not, they're different. They're apples and oranges. But one important point you must know is that th this is not just pharma studies. I can give you many studies that show access to medicines in other countries that are very, very different from the US. And I don't know about you, but if I'm a cancer patient, and I have been one, in the other countries and not the US, you get fewer treatment options. This particular study looks at over 307 drugs that were launched between 2011 and 2018. And looking at Germany, only got 64% of those medicines. US had 100 per 88% rather of those medicines, but looking at Germany, the UK, Italy, and even down to China, only having 13%, their government does restrict access to medicines. Next slide, Peter, talking about spending. Nate, where are we at with timing? We, um, we've got about 12 slides left and I want to make sure that I respect the time. Are there uh, kind of one or two main points you want to make yet? And, and then we, uh, we will make yeah. the slides available for all the task force members and on the website so people will have all the information. Great. Well, maybe, you know, just, maybe just, Peter. Just, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, just Peter, I'd like to just conclude and just say thank you guys for your time. I wanted to talk about coronavirus. We have some important slides that show um, the, the, the work we're doing that just giving you two bullet points for hope for you guys and for your family that 1,128 clinical trials are underway right now for a treatment and a vaccine. And that's in 46 different states. Um, Really good news, we're getting close. We're not there tomorrow, but within six months to a year, we should have some significant treatments. And that's because 
of the significant R&D platform we've had and we've maintained, not just in Wisconsin, but throughout the country. And we implore you, when you develop these recommendations, that they are preserving the research and development and future innovations for things not just such as coronavirus, but for all the disease states that impact patients all over the world. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, sorry we didn't have a chance to get through all this information. It's really a lot of uh, good, useful info. And as we found with a lot of the presenters in previous task force, there's just a lot of uh, previous meetings, I should say, just a lot of good information. And I know people have a lot of questions as well. So I do want to leave a little bit of time for, uh, for member questions. And it looks like, um, Brian Stam, you have, a, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so I'm going to go rapid fire here and write down questions as I go and feel free to answer what you can and feel like answering at the end, OK? And I'm sure if there's other questions that come up throughout, we can discuss it at a different time. Um, so I look at your industry um, and you, you know you start off your, your presentation here talking about the all the benefits, all the wonderful drugs that come out, how that's impacting people's lives. Sorry that the video didn't work, but I'm sure that's what it said essentially. And when you look at business and you look at a product and there's something called the four P's of marketing. One is product, placement, promotion, and price. And your products obviously work really well. That's, that's what you're touting on this one. The place really doesn't matter so much in this. The promotion, you guys have a whole budget for that. You know, it's, it's billions of dollars. And then there's the price issue, which seems to be the issue at, at hand here, certainly, but also with your industry as a whole. And I say that it's an issue because um, I, I will say that your organization personally, the ones that you all work for, spend more in lobbying than the entire tobacco industry does as a total last year, okay? So you've got an industry that literally sells products that kills people and you, they, need to, they need to essentially sell their product and sell it to, to whoever they need to to be able to continue to sell it. Whereas yours is a product that saves people's lives and yet you end up spending more on it individually just to sell it. And I think what you've got is a huge you know, consumer trust issue with this. And where I'm going with this is that there's, there's a number of things that we, you guys spoke about here in this you know, presentation here that I think are um, questionable. Um, and I think leave room for a whole bunch of other questions that, that need to be discussed. So the first thing is, the tough study that you guys, that you referenced a couple of times at $2.6 billion to get a drug out the market, that's definitely on the high end of the research that's been coming out. That study has had a number of limitations that weren't really discussed very well. Um, and there's been follow-up studies that have looked at that exact same you know, setup and they've come up with numbers of a median of 648 million. Um, and certainly there are drugs that cost into the billions, um, but it's not, it's not the average. And I don't want that displayed um, as the average cost because that, that just isn't the truth on this one. Um, you also discussed how that the operating margin or the revenue is essentially 5% within the industry. And once again, I think you're, you're cherry picking studies on this one where that's on the extreme low end when I've seen studies where it's up to 23%. So, you know, I just wanted to be known um, for all the other board, the other members in this panel, that there are there's opposition here, and then you're going to get that with any kind of science. Uh, you also mentioned that, and, and Peter, you're going to have to correct me on this one. Um, you mentioned that the the rate of getting a molecule essentially through to um, a pharmaceutical drug is five and five thousand, if I remember correctly, is what you said. And I remember, you know, this is six years ago when I was studying this in grad school, is that that rate used to be one in 10,000. So we're seeing a tenfold increase in the efficiency, effective, the efficiency of getting those drugs. And yet we're not seeing in any sort of market reproduction on that. You know, you think if something becomes so much more efficient, then in theory, it should cost less in the end. And that just doesn't seem to be what's going on here. You talk about consumer advertising and how it's costing six billion dollars a year, and yet the United States is one of two countries in the world that allows that direct consumer advertising. Wouldn't it make more sense to not have that be legal? And then you guys can save the six billion dollars and distribute that into manufacturing, and you can actually crank out six more drugs a year. Um, you talk about quality of life right off the bat, and how there's different drugs that are available in different countries and how the United States has access to so many more drugs. Well, that's also because there's a quality of life year adjustment in some of these other countries that actually take a look at the actual benefit of the drug 
put a dollar value to that and say, if you are trying to market your drug above that cost, then we're not selling your drug because it doesn't actually have value. So where I'm coming at from all this is that you all presented four solutions that really just shift the blame to other areas of the market. You know, we talked about um, we talked about PBMs. We talked about the you know, transportation cycle and the entire industry as a whole, and shifting the blame to the others. But that really it really irks me, and I got to say that from a member that um, that has pharmaceutical costs, and from someone that represents two hundred forty thousand people in the state of Wisconsin, and looking over their healthcare costs. And I was really hoping that with all the money that you all have and spend on an annual basis, that a dollar of that would have gone to some sort of idea that says, hey, we have a problem with how much we price our manufactured drugs at, and we should lower that cost for our members. That's all I have. Okay. Um, can I take a shot at a couple of those points? Well, part of, part of the things that I would like to, part of the things I would like to say is that when you, one of the statements you made was that how much manufacturers spend on um, advertising as opposed to, but one of the criticisms of our industry has been how much they spend on, they spend more on advertising or, or marketing than they do on, on R&D of their medicines. That aspect, that criticism is just factually untrue. Um, when you look, if you look closely at that criticism, they'll, they'll compare, the two numbers they're comparing are the SG&A budget and the R&D budget. I used to do finance, I used to do uh, uh, budgeting at, at several health plans. I had my medical cost budget and I had my SGNA budget. SGNA is selling general administrative expenses. Marketing is a subset of the SGNA budget. SGNA budget is larger than the amount that they spend on R&D, but marketing is not, is not greater than what they spend on, sorry, SGNA is greater than what they spend on R&D, but marketing is not greater than what they spend on R&D since it's just a subset of it, which is another falsehood that is put in the marketplace. The $2.6 billion number is from a Tufts study, Tufts Center for Drug Development. They've been doing these studies for years. This, they didn't just start recently. And there are many, there are studies that they put out a long time ago where they came back and they said that the cost of developing a medicine is a whole lot lower. And competing studies where they had to come up with on the lower end oftentimes don't factor in the cost of failures and the amount of money they need for future headroom for further and future um, drug, drug development. We're talking about how much did it cost to bring that one particular medicine to market. But if I'm a company and I'm a franchise and I've got like 10 drugs in development, only one makes it to market, that one drug that made it to market has to not only cover the cost of all the drugs that I couldn't get to market, but that's got to keep the money, the lights on to be able to pr provide funding for the other nine that I have in development. And so that's where that comes from. It's, it's their own methodology. It's not pharma's methodology. But they, but, but back in the, back in, you know, years ago when, they, when that number was much lower than 2.6 billion, there wasn't as many complaints about it. But they raised their particular number because they said that, that developing medicines is becoming more and more difficult as a low-hanging fruit has already been picked. So what you end up now is a situation where you're having to find, you know, it's much more difficult to develop these molecules to be able to, to solve the, the, to treat the medicines and diseases that we have right at this point. I'm trying to, I didn't write down the other question. You had a lot of points, but if there was another point that you specifically want us to address, let me know and I'd be happy to. Yeah, and we're just, we're going to pause it right here for now. So what we're going to do, um, because I know the presenters with Civica RX have to get off the meeting, I believe, at 1.30. We're going to pause the Q&A. And uh, if the three of you are able to stick around till 2 o'clock, that would be great. Because we'd like to hear from Civica over the next uh, roughly 30 minutes. And then once their presentation is done, I'd like to come back and give uh, members a chance to, to ask additional questions. So I hope that works for your schedules. Okay. Thanks for being flexible. We're just trying to make sure everyone gets a chance to present and also ask questions. So we're going to, there we go, get up the Civica presentation. Heather, are you ready to present? I am. Nathan, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank Sorry you. for the delay. I appreciate you being flexible and thanks for being here today. Really appreciate it. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to do just a brief introduction of myself and then turn uh, the time over to my colleague Mo to introduce himself as well. Uh, and what you'll hear today from Civica is a little different than what has already been discussed 
over the course of the last few hours. But what I hope you will take away from it is uh, that there are ways to implement solutions to many of the things that we've been discussing, and uh, we've set, we we are moving towards that solution uh, in some in some circumstances for Civica. So by way of introduction, again, my name is Heather Wall. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Civica, uh, but my background is not pharmaceuticals. My background is hospital operations, and I had the opportunity to uh, to uh, run and operate a, a hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah, that treated uh, the bone marrow transplant patient as well as a 60-bed behavioral health unit uh, for the facility, as well as the indigent care patient population uh, for the Salt Lake Valley. So when you think about uh, the need to bring affordable and quality medications to patients, that was, uh, that was an area where I had the opportunity uh, to dive right on in based off of the patient population that we serve. Um, may I ask you to go to the next slide, and then Mo may ask you to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, certainly. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely can. Thank you, Mo. Yeah, thank you. My name is Mo Karbat. I'm the Regional mm -hmm. VP of Pharmacy Services for SSM Health um, in the Wisconsin market. We have seven hospitals here in Wisconsin, and I also serve on the Civica Drug Selection Advisory Committee. Perfect, Mo. Thank you very much for that introduction, and I will uh, turn the time over to you here in just one second. So, by way of background, uh, Civica is an institution that was created by health systems across the country. We are uh, unique in that we are a manufacturing company, but we are a not-for-profit manufacturing companies started by health systems across the country. Uh, to date, we have 50 health systems that are a part of Civica. Uh, Mo's going to talk a little bit more about that development. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to call out right at the beginning uh, is that one of the reasons for Civica is that we wanted the ability to have the folks that both procure the medications as well as administer the medications be the ones to decide which medications that Civica manufactures. And that we found that to be exceptionally beneficial during the course of the last uh, six months. For, uh, for the medications that are currently being used to treat the comorbidities for COVID patients within uh, inpatient institutions, a little over half of our medications are being used because the health systems that needed the medications are the ones that prioritize the medications for development. Next slide, please. Uh, Mo, can I go ahead and have you uh, uh, do the introduction for what Civica is uh, for, the, for the next two slides, please? Yeah, certainly. So thanks, everyone. So um, uh, Civica was established almost uh, uh, two years ago now uh, by health systems that came together to address the issue of drug shortages in the marketplace. As you may know, um, generic, mainly generic drugs, have been a long list of them have been in short supply over the past several years, and. Uh, um, and, and some of them that, that continue to be available, uh, we've seen huge price increases. So there is, you know, the reason behind some of these shortages was because um, generic drug companies were unable to turn a profit on these products. So some generic drug companies were exiting the market, leaving one or two manufacturers for each one of these essential generic drugs that health systems and hospitals depend on for patient care. And, and when that happened, we've seen uh, drug uh, shortages and interruptions in the market and, and price increases. So visionary leaders from some health systems at Inner Mountain Health, Mayo Clinic, SSM Health came together and established Civica to ensure that the drug products that health systems and hospitals need for patient care continue to be available. So uh, as of now, we have 50 health systems that are members in Civica, and there's about 1,200 hospitals across the country. 30% of U.S. licensed hospital beds, and Civica um, is licensed to um, provide uh, or distribute drug products in all 50 states. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, Civica's membership has three levels. So we have governing members. <clears throat> governing members are health systems that basically established Civica early on, including Mayo Clinic, uh, Inner Mountain Health, SSM Health, and SSM Health, as I mentioned, operates uh, seven hospitals here in, in Wisconsin, in addition to the Dean Clinic uh, uh, Medical Group, as well as Monroe Clinic and uh, Dean Health Clinic. So uh, then there are founding members. 
founding members are members that helped found the company and also serve uh, on the Drug Selection Advisory Committee, helping advise Civica on what products to make to improve patient care and ensure the stability of the supply chain. Here in Wisconsin, uh, advocate Aurora is a founding member, uh, uh, as well in addition to SSM Health. And then there are partnering members, members who sign up with Civica, who have the same access to the same drugs at the same price, but uh, they're not uh, part of the founding members in terms of uh, uh, um, being involved in the drug selection process. And here in Wisconsin, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Aspirus Health is, is a part of the member. And uh, so that's who we are, that's what Civica is, and we're very proud of what we've done in the past two years. And, and as a matter of fact, here in Wisconsin, at St. Mary's Hospital in Madison, at the Aurora hospitals as well, we use Civica drugs on a daily basis. And, and thanks to this effort that started two years ago, and, and that's where we are today. Thank you. Perfect, thanks Mo. Could I have you go to the next slide, please? Uh, something that Mo mentioned that I wanted to spend some time commenting on uh, is the fact that for our Civica medications, it is a single price for every, uh, for every health system that purchases Civica medications. So we've spent a lot of time today talking about rebates and, and other types of things um, that lead to, to a, a little bit of a lack of transparency into what pricing looks like for medications. Uh, while, while I realize that we are talking right now about that inpatient side, when we think about the way that we structured Civica, it was a single price for every medication for every health system, whether it was a 20-bed critical access hospital in Nevada or the largest health system across the country. Uh, every health system had the ability to, uh, to purchase Civica medications at a single transparent price. And by transparent, I mean our health systems understand the cost of goods sold, uh, the cost of Civica overhead, the cost of research and development that our health systems are prioritizing for the next round of, of uh, medications. And that is the same price for any hospital that chooses to engage uh, with Civica and to purchase Civica medications. We are focusing on two major things, uh, stability of, of supply and price. Mo mentioned that we were started uh, really to address shortage concerns, and that continues to be the case. As we look at what essential medications are used both on the inpatient side and then do translate over into the outpatient side, we want to make sure that medications that are needed for essential patient care are available. Uh, and so we're focusing on those drug shortages. And then we're focusing in that stability in both price and st supply to make sure that our health system partners who see us as a solution know that that is going to be the case uh, from now and into perpetuity. May I have you go to the next slide, please? So the, the Civica model is a little bit different than uh, what we've seen uh, in the past. And again, we've also spent a lot of time today talking about the supply chain and uh, where, where it may or may not be appropriate for us to be disruptive within the supply chain. So as we, as we look at the way that the Civica model works, our health system partners end up uh, looking at the medications that Civica prioritizes and opting in or opting out to the purchase of those medications. If they opt in, they are opting in for a five-year time frame, and they are doing that so not only that they can assure the stability of supply for that five-year time frame, but that stability in pricing for that five-year time frame as well. Uh, we make the same commitment to our uh, our our contract manufacturing location supply partners to assure that we are uh, that we have those medications that are needed for our health system partners, and that uh, that is then something that is prioritized uh, uh, and and stable for the course of the next five years. Next slide, please. We have a three-pronged manufacturing approach. Uh, as Mo had mentioned, we have, now, we have now brought in the course of a little less than two years, 19 essential generic medications to our health system partners across the country in the course uh, of a little less than two years. We were able to do this because we are working with generic drug manufacturers that do have the uh, FDA approved manufacturing facilities, and we are manufacturing the Civica labeled, Civica owned uh, drug product so that we can assure that we have the amount of medication required to serve uh, the, the, the health systems that are a part of Civica. At the same time, 
we are working to apply for those abbreviated new drug applications or the FDA's license to manufacture for generic drugs. Uh, and that, that assures that not only do we have uh, the ability to, to own the right to manufacture ourselves, but we have that duality of supply in that our owned manufacturing facilities will be manufacturing Civica products as well as um, our partner facilities will have the ability to, to uh, be manufacturing that Civica product as well. Uh, what we've also found, uh, in addition to pricing being a concern for stability of supply, is that uh, taking the ability to manufacture medications down to one or two locations is a concern across the United States. If a hurricane hits a manufacturing plant or if the FDA has a concern with manufacturing in one, if we do not have that duality of manufacturing supply, we end up in a, in a circumstance where we, we need, to, uh, need to, uh, to have additional uh, supply manufacturing facilities. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Again, I mentioned that there were 19 medications that have been prioritized by our health system partners. Uh, Mo mentioned our Drug Selection Advisory Committee. This is something that I think is pretty critical in the way that Civica operates. Uh, the health systems that founded and started Civica are the ones who come together on a quarterly basis to discuss the medication needs in the health systems and prioritize the drugs that are uh, essential for manufacturing. And only then does Civica choose to manufacture those drugs. So uh, we have 19 drugs that have been brought forward by the Drug Selection Advisory Committee. And by the end of this year, we will have a total of 40 Civica medications that are both uh, available for delivery and distribution to our health system partners. Uh, so that we can meet the patient needs across the country. Uh, that time frame is, is fast, and, and we know that that is a, is a fast time frame. And again, it's because we do have the ability to partner within the pharmaceutical industry and in parallel uh, work to get the, uh, that license to manufacture with Civica. Something else that I would mention, uh, again, because we've been talking about the different players in the supply chain today, is that Civica has intentionally and deliberately changed the way that we, uh, that we work within the supply chain. So Civica delivers directly to our health system partners. Our, our health systems order, order medications directly from Civica, and at that same single price point, we deliver that. So it is a, it is a, a, a cost of drugs that is delivered uh, to our health system partners. That way our health system partners know that the medications that they have committed to and that are prioritized are going to be delivered to the docs of their facilities uh, at the price that they committed to. And again, as I mentioned, 19 drugs that are being delivered right now, 40 that will be delivered to our health system partners by the end of the year. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this, this uh, as I've listened to the conversation over the course of the last little bit, uh, the, the focus has been more on the retail and the, uh, the outpatient space. In January, uh, a new entity for Civica was announced that is focusing on the development and the manufacturing of high-cost generic drugs in the retail space. And I will focus on that word, generic. Uh, it, it, we are very deliberately and intentionally focusing on medications where we can appropriately reduce the cost and do so uh, in the outpatient and the retail space. Uh, really what our intent here is that we have proven that we have the ability to put appropriate disruptive innovation in the inpatient and outpatient space in the hospitals. We want to continue to move that into the outpatient and retail space as well. And so we are starting uh, that, uh, the, uh, we, we've started that process in prioritizing and doing the re and beginning the process for research and development in the outpatient space uh, in this year in 2020. Next year, please. All right, I'm sorry, next slide, please. So with that, again, I wanted to just t uh, take the time to say thank you to this task force for thinking through different ways that we can work to reduce the overall cost of medications. Uh, we have shown that on the inpatient side, there's absolutely the way for the folks uh, that actually utilize the medications to come together to think about the way that we manufacture medications and the way that we put them in the hands of the healthcare providers that need them and that we can do that different than has been done in the past. 
I think there's an absolute way for us to be able to do that uh, in the outpatient and retail space as well. And a lot of what's been discussed today gives us the ability to do so. Uh, with that, Mo, I'm going to also just uh, pause and see if you have anything addition, uh, in addition to add to the conversation uh, that we've had around what Civica was created for and what we expect to accomplish not only now, uh, but in the, into the future, both in the health system space, but also in the retail and outpatient space. Yeah, thanks, Heather. You covered it well. And um, uh, there is a great level of enthusiasm by all health systems that take part in Civica in knowing that these simple generic drugs like heparin and, and sodium bicarb and these simple generic drugs have been around forever to make sure that they will not be in short supply anymore. And um, with, with, the, with the products from Civica on the market and available to us now, we can now say, we could not have said this two years ago, now we can say that these drugs will not be in short supply. So thanks uh, to you Evelyn, for the, um, the entire Civica team and, and, and we're glad that we're able to um, be part of it. And here in Wisconsin, uh, uh, Civica's products will continue to shore up the supply chain and hopefully keep the prices down uh, uh, for, for our patients. So thank you. Perfect, thank you. Wisconsin team, again, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to present. Uh, if there's any questions that, uh, that, that you may have for us, we would welcome the opportunity to address them. Great, thank, thank you so much, Heather Mo. really appreciate it. Uh, very interesting, innovative model. Um, you know, we've been hearing Civica come up in different conversations, so we really appreciate both of you taking the time to be here and, and provide us a little more information about uh, your history and, and what you've been doing and where you're going. So thank you. Uh, right, are there any questions the at this point? Any questions from uh, any of the task force members? Okay. okay well, I guess you. you're off the hook. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think we're going to use the last, we have about 40 minutes left. Uh, I know we cut short. Um, our question and answer period uh, from the um, uh, manufacturer representatives. So I do want to continue that discussion. I will say before we dive back in, I just want to make sure that we continue to have a professional and productive uh, discussion here. I know there's a lot of strong opinions around some of these issues. People are very passionate uh, about their perspective on a number of these issues, but uh, we really want to make sure that we're being uh, productive in, in our question and answer session here and really appreciate the uh, manufacturer representatives um, flexibility to stick around and, and answer questions through the end of the hour. So thank you very much. So I will circle back. I think Janet, you had indicated that you had a couple questions. Did you, uh, you still want to chime in? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One is about the comments that were made about coupons. Um, that would count toward the deductible. Uh, why do PBMs, I guess there's two questions. So why do PBMs or insurance companies care about that if the price is coming out of the manufacturer's pocket and not the patient pocket? Why does it matter to the PBMs that they would fight against that or are they? And the second question has to do with the importation. The prices in other countries uh, being lower than in the U.S., does that have to do with PBMs and the rebates? So Janet, this is Sharon. I'll take uh, some of that and see if uh, my colleagues want to add on to that. The first one was the AAP bans, and that, um, and I don't know if the PBMs are fighting against it. I know some of the health plans would like to continue using the ban the bans, um, but it's simply not in the best interest of patients. If patients can have any assistance from manufacturers count toward their out-of-pocket deductible, it should happen. Otherwise, it's almost like the health plans are double dipping. You know, they're getting um, the payment from the patient to get to their out-of-pocket deductible uh, limit and they're getting, you know, assistance. So it just doesn't make sense. It, it's one of those things where patient groups all over the country are pushing for this and I know there is some ambiguity with the IRS. Um, uh, we, 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 there's thought that we disagree that, that uh, requiring high deductible health plans will run afoul of the IRS provisions. Um, but we know that's to be determined and yet we'll see more. But I think in it, right now we are supportive of those four states and hopefully we're gonna see it in other states where those bans are implemented. 
And then you asked about importation, and I should have written that down. What was that question again, real quick, Janet? So if the prices are higher in the U.S. than in other countries, is that because of PBM rebates that it's higher in the U.S.? I, I don't know that. I know that um, I don't know how PBMs work in other countries. Uh, we just know that I know that right now no HHS secretary is certified that it's safe. We know that it doesn't save money. Importation, while it has passed in six states, we still await the administration's guidance, but it is not the answer to lowering prescription drug prices. But does any of my colleagues have something to add, Peter or Samuel? Sure. Um, the reason why drug, pri drug prices are lower in other countries than they are in the United States, and it's largely because a lot of those countries have uh, single payer socialized medicine systems where the government sets the price of the drug. Now, some people think that's a good idea to do in the United States, but the downside of what we're talking about there is a lack of innovation and the availability of medicines in those particular markets. And the delay in it takes to get, it takes a, a, for a cancer medicine, it takes at least two years longer to get access to a cancer medicine in Europe than it does in the United States. Um, which is some people might think, again, that's not that big of a deal unless you have cancer and you don't have those two years to be able basically to, to wait for that. So the, so the access to medicine is delayed and they have access to far fewer medicines. Um, in the developing world, you can maybe understand the logic of some, some of what they do because they could not afford some of those medicines. But this is also happening in, in very much developed first world Western European countries. And we don't believe that that's an appropriate way to go about running an industry. We don't, we don't have... Um, government setting prices, uh, having price controls in this country on any industry. Thank you very much. Yeah. So Brent, I think, did you want to uh, add something, add some perspective on the, the issue of uh, payers' perspective on the bans? Brent, I think you're on mute. Sorry, too many mute buttons. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Sorry. Janet, I was just going to address your question about why payers would be against, generally against an AAP ban. And the reason for that is, is if a, a, a group develops a plan design that has a thousand dollar deductible, but the member only paid $20 and the remainder of the, the say they got a thousand dollar drug, a specialty drug, and the member actually only paid a $50 copay and the manufacturer paid the rest. They've really only contributed $50 to their deductible they didn't actually fulfill what is in their plan contract in terms of actually paying for the thousand dollars. So that's, that's the concept as to why should manufacturer copay dollars really count towards a member's deductible or should the member be fully responsible for that deductible, which is why then there's an IRS component to it. So I, I guess I have another question then. So how is that different? How is it different if the manufacturer pays for it than if I pay for my neighbor's uh, copay because I'm generous. How's it different than if someone else pays the copay? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes. I, I think that's a good, I mean, that's part of the argument is who, when does it become, what is actually fulfilling the member's obligation to their deductible? Does manufacturer dollars, should that count? Or are those manufacturer dollars there to be used to really a different way? And I think that's the debate about how these programs are set up. So again, it's, it's from, there's two different views. It's definitely, I'm trying to articulate is from the payer perspective that the payers definitely have a view that if the member has a thousand dollar deductible, that member should pay it and a manufacturer shouldn't be paying the deductible on behalf of the member. Is that because the manufacturer should decrease the price in a different way? Correct. I mean, the reason like on a, on a, there is a the manufacturer has set a price and that price is at a level that the member can't pay. And so why should the member, why should that excuse the member's deductible? Okay. Thank can you. I, can I add something to that, please? Um, all right. So these copay, so manufacturer coupons are typically used in an area where there is a big gap between the list price and the net price of a drug. Not always, but a lot of times that, that, that they are used between that, where the patient cost sharing amount is viewed to be quite burdensome for that, for that particular patient. So 
when we, when we went back to the example of how money flows and why prices are where they are and why wouldn't they be easy to be lowered, I wanted to, it's one point I didn't make that I wanted to make there is that when we talk about PBMs and rebates in this environment within this country, there's three main ways that they make money in this, in this overall system. One is they keep a percentage of the rebate. Two is that they charge administrative fees, which are a percentage of the list price fees to the manufacturer. And three is they have something called price protection, which is not as many people know about. Price protection is our inflation protection. It's a stop loss that the PBM has put into place into the maximum amount of list price increases that a manufacturer can take in a given year or over the term of a contract. So say, uh, for example, if a manufacturer, if they set that price protection level at say hypothetically a 6% price increase for a 12 month period, and the manufacturer took a 10% price increase for that 12 month period, that remaining 4% has to be rebated back to the PBM. So the PBM would not, and the, but they don't call it a rebate. Oftentimes, so when you talk about, you know, they, pass, they say they would pass 90% or 100% of rebates through back to the plan sponsor, it's depending on what is actually called the rebate. If it's called a fee, or if it's some sort of inflation protection element, then it's, not, then it's not included, which is what is preventing a lot of times from companies who really do want to lower their list price. Because if I have like, a, say, a $100 list price, and I'm paying an 80% rebate down to a $20 net price, as a manufacturer, I'm getting $20. Right? It doesn't make any difference to me whether the list price is 100 or whether the list price is 40. I, w I just need a little bit of room to have differential contracting so that I can give a better deal potentially to my better customer, which happens anywhere all the time in business and in, in any business. But there's no need to have an 80% rebate there. So if, I, if I'm a manufacturer and the patient is having to pay their cost sharing off of the list price of a medicine, which is not written in stone anywhere, that's just a choice on a benefit design that the, that the, that the insurer you know, predicates that the manufacturer, that the patient's cost insurance, cost um, sharing has to be based on the list price of the medicine. If they were, if they would base the cost sharing off the net price of the medicine, there'd be no need for coupons. But the reason why the coupons are given by manufacturers is to try to make medicines more affordable for patients to increase their overall adherence to, adherence to therapy. So it's kind of like a catch-22. You don't want to do, you don't want to do the things that allow a manufacturer to lower the list price but at the same time, you want, you want to take away the tool the manufacturer has to help a patient afford their, afford their care. So I have one more question, if I could follow up. Why not put the list price at $40 then? If you're just it's, one. I, sure, say, say I'm one of three manufacturers. And so there's three companies have a similar product. Um, they're all competing. Competing brand to brand competition. Not, this is before a generic comes onto the market. And they're relatively interchangeable. Could be an insulin, could be any number of you know, before, before statins, when generic may be a statin. And one of them decides to do that. Say one company decides to just drop, keep their list price. They all have similar list prices, all have similar low net prices. And one of them says, you know what, I'm gonna lower my, I'm gonna lower my list price. There's a first mover penalty in that because you pay those rebates for formulary access. If you lower the list price down, since every entity in the supply chain is their revenue is tied to the list price of the drug, then everybody in the supply chain makes less money on the drug. It's not the manufacturer. Manufacturer is still gonna make the net price if that stays the same. They're still gonna make that $20. But if you drop your, if you ever drop your list from 100 to 40, then if everybody else's revenue is tied to that $100 as a percentage of that $100 list price number, and they all make less in that entire system. So what happens to that first mover? They all of a sudden find themselves being kicked off a formulary. And if you've got such market consolidation with like, you know, PBMs having 80 to 90 million covered lives each, you try going to your boss and saying, sir, I just lost access to 90 million people for our product. That can have a rather devastating impact on a company's business because you have people can't get your drug. They'll just say, no, I like your competitors better they're gonna get the formulary access and you're not. And that's happened. So this is not like some theoretical type of thing. That's actually, that's actually happened. Which is, what we, which is why, why coupons are necessitated in many cases in the first place. It's because patient cost sharing levels are at burdensome at very high levels, when in fact the overall cost to the system for prescription drugs comparative to everything else, everything in our system costs a lot of money, but it's like, you know, we're, we're, for brand medicines, we're talking about 7% of what we spend on healthcare after rebates and discounts are removed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
So I'm following up on that. So do you, do you have a different perspective on PBMs that are full pass-through versus those that retain a portion of the rebates uh, in light of everything that you're saying? Yeah, I think Navitus is a very good example that you have there. I mean, I, I admire them. I met Brett a few years ago when I was in, in Wisconsin. I think that this is, this, it's, a, it's a good model. Actually, in, on the federal level, there's um, actually a bill in the Senate Help Committee, which, which is a Section 306 of the Senate Help Bill right now, which talks about 100% rebate and fee passed through to the plan sponsor. We believe it should be to the patient, but this would, this would include in the commercial market, so employers as well. So that would go all the way to the plan sponsor and everybody in the supply chain, instead of getting paid as a percent of the list price, they would just get paid a flat fee, a fair market value flat fee for the services that they render. If there's like two, say you have two pill bottles, one costs $200, one costs $2,000. And I do the same amount of work. I'm just moving it from point A to point B. If I'm the PBM, I'm not even taking physical possession of the drug. I'm just moving paper. Why should I get paid 10 times more for the $2,000 pill bottle than I did for the $200 pill bottle? You should be paid for the work that you do. And so in that bill, 100% of rebates and fees would be passed through to the plan sponsor, would not be coming back to manufacturers, but they would get the benefit, which would hopefully then result in lower premiums. And then we would have to ask the, the plan sponsors to basically pass those rebates on back down to the patients. Essentially, it would, it'd be great if we could get to a system where, where, the, the list, where, where the revenue of those supply chain entities was no longer linked to the list price of the drug. They, they would be agnostic to the list price of a drug. They would just contract based on the net price. And then, then at that point in time, if there's no first mover penalty, you, would, you could potentially see for a company, individual company, it might make a lot more sense for me to, to lower my list price because then my, the patient cost sharing amount would go down. Therefore, it would in, increase my ability to market my product and it could potentially increase utilization of my product. Sorry, I wasn't unmuted. Thank you, appreciate that follow. Uh, right. No, no worries. Alan, you had a couple questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I just would like to first recognize uh, Brian Stam's comment, a very poignant summary comment, twofold that I think was making a statement, putting it delicately, that we need to be more collaborative instead of blaming um, where we're sitting across the aisle. Uh, I think we need to be thinking that way. Number two, he used the word uh, efficiency or in the, I should say the realm of inefficiency. And I'll just, I, and I don't want an answer to this, and I'll just make a statement and sign off. Um, I go back uh, quite a few years where I remember, yes, you know, I'm old when I start saying that. Uh, the price of insulin, a vial of Humalog in 1996 was $40. Uh, inflation adjusted to 2020, that would make it $67.66. Today, the list price is $329.64. So, when you look at all the other uh, consumer price indices for various products and industries, food, gasoline, technology, energy, electricity, you name it, automobiles after inflation adjusting have all come down. So that gets to Brian's point, efficiency. Why would something that has an improved efficiency in manufacturing over time just basically go up fivefold over that course of 15 years, excuse me, 25 years with basically no justification behind it. And I'll just make that statement. So um, the other part is more collaboratively, I'm willing to have a discussion in concept about net price. Let's, let's reset the price uh, floor. Let's say that net price is, is determined we drop price 50%. But that's not the full equation that we need to deal with. We also know that what is driving drug cost or drug cost burden is mix uh, because it's not so much that it's, it's maybe the cost of the drug or a singular drug. It's are we using more brands than we are generics? And then there's the utilization component. So my point being, there's a formula called trend, how you calculate the increasing spend over time and its price mix and utilization. If we go to a net pricing model, <clears throat> there needs to be agreement that we maximize a very high percentage of generics first and keep that above maybe a 95, 96% threshold. 
and that utilization needs to be reduced because that would also be evidence-based where we don't have value. We, we, we should not be supporting that utilization. Uh, unnecessary medication use, I have all the evidence and we can basically discuss that, will only increase harm and nobody on this task force or visiting should be supporting that type of uh, utilization. So really it, the broader formula that should be discussed is look at lower net price, but understand we need to manage the product mix and lower utilization. And I think we get somewhere with lower cost overall, but improved health outcomes. Alan, just a, a brief response to that. They, I mean, right now we have 90% generic utilization across the country. Now keep one thing in mind, every one of those generic drugs used to be a brand. So if a brand company hadn't done the R&D research development, brought that product to market, it would never have gone through its life cycle, gone off patent and been available as an, as an inexpensive generic. They wanna to try to drive that utilization rate up higher than 90%, then that's, you know, if the doctor feels that that's, that's what is appropriate for the patient, then, then so be it. But what I'm kind of what I'm gonna get back to is that there, there is an appropriate place for brand products. And you have to sit there and say that maybe those 10% of cases where people are getting brand medicines, that they actually need those brand medicines because people's physiology is not all the same. Sometimes, I mean, my father, he took three, stat, three stats before one of them actually worked for him. And so it's, at that point, we would leave it up to a physician to be able to use. And, and also what, something that uh, Dr. Popovian had said earlier, we're looking at the Kaiser example, is that when you go back down to net price contracting like Kaiser does, their biosimilar utilization is far higher than it is overall in the country that there's a lot of players in the market that for, who are being financially incentivized to push particular products that it might not be, it might be better to move to that type of system. So, yeah, I thank you for that. Um, but um, it's not just the physician, it's the evidence. I'm not going to leave it with the physician with all due respect to the remarkably talented physicians we have. My point being, and we don't need to be in a defensive position, is we have to look at the evidence as to where we can get the lowest net cost look at product mix, understanding brands have their use, but if I can show metformin has greater value uh, when it's adhered to at max dose than a drug that costs $1,200 a month, you can't support promoting the brand drug if you haven't maximized metformin use. That's a fact that's proven medically. Utilization, 30% of utilization is unnecessary and we don't have good diagnostics to make determinations, for example, when TNF inhibitors are used in inflammatory diseases, response rate for ACR 20 or 50 is not even 47%, huge wasteful spend. We need to manage that more effectively. Otherwise, all you're gonna have are escalating drug budgets. We need to walk back and start considering different models and maybe it's a value-based model. I think we need to move on, so I'm gonna hand it back to Nathan. Um, this is Sharon. I just wanted to add, thank you, Alan, for your comments. And I just wanted to thank you, Nathan, for letting us present. I'm disappointed in Alan's comments and Brian's comments that it felt like it was finger pointing today. I was hopeful that we, our colleagues, could bring a very educated discussion to what is the task force on reducing prescription drug prices. That's our opportunity as an industry to respond and educate on using facts and, and figures and studies that we have and hopefully having a more of an open dialogue and our attempt to provide solutions. I don't believe it is finger pointing things like passing on the rebate, sharing the rebates, changing how the supply chain is currently working is not finger pointing. It's an actual solution being debated on the federal and the state level, but um, disappointing to hear those two comments, but I appreciated everybody else's comments and and we look forward to working with you guys. We, we know this is not an easy, easy task for you all. And we remain here in place to try to work and collaborate and, and certainly would love to have any follow-up anybody wants one-on-one -on -one or otherwise. Thank yeah, you. I'm remarkably disappointed too, equally. Well, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. And thank you, Samuel and Peter. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, as you can imagine, we've had uh, some some very passionate exchanges uh, over the course of the last few months on a variety of topics. And you know, I know um, you know everyone has a different perspective on these issues. And uh, that you know, part of when we put this task force together, we wanted to bring people around the table who have very different backgrounds and perspectives. And uh, you know, we thought that was important for really trying to dig into this work and hopefully find some meaningful solutions. But Obviously, as part of that, sometimes uh, things can get a little heated. So 
Um, appreciate you sticking around to answer the questions and being flexible with your time and really appreciate all the information you provided today. I think that was really helpful. Uh, just a lot of good, a lot of good information for all of us to absorb. And uh, I, I found it very educational. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I know we have uh, a little under 20 minutes left. We did power through our break time today. So, um, you know, happy to open it up if people have any questions or any topics they want to bring up for discussion during our last few minutes here. Uh, we are obviously meeting again tomorrow, um, which will be, a, it's a very full day. Uh, we really want to get started as close to 10 o'clock as possible because uh, we're, we have a lot of presenters and uh, we're going to be tight on time as it is. Um, and then of course we're going to regroup one time in August on the 25th for a, a, a focused discussion. Uh, the entire four hours will be just focused on discussion time around the policy uh, proposals that we've heard. Uh, so that'll be a good time just for people to, to bring ideas to the table and uh, be ready to ask questions and um, just talk through a number of things. So I'll stop there, just ask if anyone has any other issues they wanna bring up or questions they wanna ask. Okay, well, thank you all. Really appreciate the, uh, the presentations today. Really appreciate uh, the, the questions that were being asked. I think this is an important part of this process is really having the back and forth and um, uh, just really appreciate all of that and, and just appreciate everyone's time. I know this is a, a lot of commitment, but uh, it's really important work. So with that, um, I guess we will we'll end the meeting and we'll see everyone back here at 10 o'clock tomorrow. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.